Good morning, this is the Eager Beaver Show. You are listening to a True North Eager Beaver Media Incorporated podcast. The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters. CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm-fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. Well, good morning and hello, kids, and welcome to season three and episode number 320 of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryo Media Network. Yeah. Yeah. Today, recording day, is Monday, February 19th, 2024. And if you are in Alberta, British Columbia, New Brunswick, Ontario, and Saskatchewan, it's Family Day. If you're in Manitoba, it's Louis Riel Day. If you're in Prince Edward Island, it's Islander Day. And it's Heritage Day in Nova Scotia. I hope that you're enjoying your day off. I'm working. You're working? Yeah, I don't have the day off. I work. Uh, oh, I'm okay. contracted to a Crown Corp, so I have to work. That's true. Yes. I, um, I definitely do have the day off. But I didn't take the day off for you, kids, because it's family day, and you're the best damn fam in all of podcasting. That was pretty so, good. That was pretty how good. could I not not show up? Pretty, right? I didn't see that one coming. Yeah, 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 yeah. Always working. <laughs> I see that. Yes. I'm your host, the eager beaver pronouns, he, him, he, Mr. Beaver, a, and with me as always is my good friend, Mr. Grizzly. We have probably more than a nibble for you this today. We'll see how much we got for you. But before we do anything more, we got to thank our podcast founding sponsors, The Pepper Master, The Miss Fee Mysteries from Corbin Moon Publishing, and Canadian Tarot. Dot, dot, let's try that again. Canadian Tarot.com. And ask Mr. Grizzly, how's your mental health doing today, sir? Oh, I like that t shirt, by the way. Oh, thanks. Um, this morning, uh, good, really good this morning. It was. Terrible last night, but it was weird how last night went. Oh. I, I um, did, a, did a few things around the house yesterday and then uh, took a nap for about 35 minutes because I was just, I was just burnt. So I took a nap and I woke up and I felt better. So I went for a walk around the neighborhood, went to check out some winter loot activities on Spark Street. Okay. Saw that there were about a dozen people milling around the front gates of Parliament Hill. <laughs> <laughs> ignored them went back to enjoying winter lude uh, they had free hot chocolate and free apple cider there's quite a few people out actually because it was surprisingly uh, milder than it was supposed to be so there was a good crowd and i just wandered down elgin street came home and uh, had a bite to eat and went and met a friend for a beer and uh, came home and sat down on the couch and turned on oppenheimer around I guess I had dinner, so it must have been around seven o'clock ish. Okay. I got it. This is the third time I tried to watch it. I, I think I'm doomed to not be able to watch it. I just can't get into it. I fell asleep within 15 minutes. Woke oh. up at 9 30, groggy and confused. I'm like, oh, I should go to bed. And I'm like, 9 30. Oh, I can't go to bed now. So then I watched the documentary and I was up till 1 30 in the morning. So Oppenheimer put you to sleep, but a documentary kept you up yeah okay that's interesting yeah i'm not saying it's a bad film i just i'm i'm just not i'm just not enjoying it, it oppenheimer must be to you what avatar was to me mm. 
Because everybody watched it, everybody liked it, got nominated for a bunch of awards, won a whole bunch of stuff. And it's like I have tried three or four times now, and every time I've like fallen asleep about half an hour into it. Oh, okay. Mm. <laughs> and I wake up like for the big battle scene at the end. I know how it ends. <laughs> I just don't know what happens after 15, between the first 15 minutes and <laughs> the final well, battle scene. I think in my case, it's because I've seen films about this before. And in this case, it, it's, it jumps around a lot in time. And the film, the last one I saw was a bunch of years ago, maybe maybe 20 years ago, I don't recall exactly. And in that film, they start with the idea of, you know, atomic energy, atomic explosions, and then they move on from there. They build the bomb, the bomb gets dropped, so on and so forth. And I felt that was engaging. In this one, they jump back and forth in time, and I just, I'm not, I can't engage with the story. So I think I'm doomed to never watch it, to be honest with you. Wow, okay. Well, um... They had the BAFTAs last night, which is the British Academy of Film and oh, Television yes. Awards, and uh, it swept. Oh yeah, I've no doubt. I'm sure it's a great film. Christopher Nolan always makes good movies. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. I just, I just could not engage with this. So yeah, so I tossed and turned all night, and then finally woke up and got up this morning, and I was lying in bed, you know, around one thirty, I guess, and having that existential crisis of, what is all of this for? Is any of this worthwhile? I'm alone. I'm empty. It happens to me frequently. And woke up this morning. None of that was there. Oh, that's good. Yeah. So woke up this morning feeling great. Got up, made some coffee, started logging on, getting the stuff ready to go for the show. And it's like, yeah, no, I'm good this morning. It was literally like maybe a 20 minute period of, of existential crisis. And that's just, you know, the, the old ways, fatigue kicking in, the medication doesn't work a hundred percent of the time. So, yeah. I'm fine Ooh. this morning now. I feel great. Cool, cool. It's a, uh, when you were mentioning that Oppenheimer shifts all over in time, it made me think of one Pulp Fiction because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. it does that. But it made me think of Memento as well. And I was sitting there and I was going, was Memento Christopher Nolan too? And it was. Yeah, it was a Christopher Nolan film. And Memento I really enjoyed. I did too. Uh, I just found it was a little bit more engaging. This was very slow moving for me and I, j- I just couldn't get into it. Okay. I don't know. Maybe it's a frame of mind thing. It, it could be. There are certain movies like that that I have to have absolutely be like, you know, if I'm going to watch Schindler's List, for example, I'm not. Yeah. Like, it's like I need to be in the mood to see like a, a serious film. I've never seen Schindler's List. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Just because I, I don't know if I can emotionally deal with it. Like I started to watch Killers of the Flower Moon and I realized Bridget wanted to watch that with me. So I stopped, but it, it's, I might have got 45 minutes into it and it's not boring. It's, it's dry, but it's good storytelling. It's good acting. I think I can watch that through, but it'll be tough because I know the story, right? Mm. Yeah, indeed. Uh, so yeah, Oppenheimer won seven prizes, best picture, director, and actor um, among them. So I think uh, it had 30, 13 nominations oh, wow. in all at the BAFTAs. And uh, the best film award uh, in a bit of a surprise, was presented by Michael J. Fox. Oh, wow. That That is yeah, unexpected, huh? Eh? Yeah. I'm sure he got a standing O when he walked out on stage. I would not be surprised, to be totally honest. I can't say that he did because I don't know. Oh, okay. Because <laughs> I heard it on the news this morning, ah, okay. <laughs> and I haven't seen any visuals yet. But, uh, yeah. It's, it, it. I mean, you know, with Parkinson's and everything, right? Is it Parkinson's? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Parkinson's, so, uh, yeah. Yeah, so you know it's you're you're not always at your best. So you know it's almost like with Celine Dion when she made her her appearance uh, at the Grammys. You know, right. Like, you never know what days are going to work for you and what days are not. So it's it's always a bit of an event. And I mean, he's just so beloved. Mm-hmm. Oh yeah. I don't think there's anybody that doesn't like him. I've never heard a bad word about him. Uh, neither have I actually. You know that. Um... He'll be the first to tell you that when he was younger. I watched a documentary about him recently, and he, he'll tell you, you know, when he was younger, much younger, he was pretty cocky and arrogant, which is par for the course for any young man for the most part. Well, I think he was the most bankable movie movie star for a while, wasn't yeah. he? Yeah, yeah. He had a few years in the 80s where there basically he was box office platinum, not gold, but platinum. Anyway, he talks about how um, how he met and Tracy Pollan on the set, his wife, and how he made um, not the most polite comment to her. It wasn't sexist or anything like that. And she just looked at him and said, you're rude and an asshole. 
and he said that was it i was sold because <laughs> she wouldn't she wouldn't put up with any of my crap right from the get-go and and he said i realized that's what i needed in my life and they basically fell in love shortly thereafter and have been together ever since there you go yeah it's it's a document i think it's i think it's on netflix i watched it a while ago it's really well done and he it, it's a warts and all documentary where he shows you some of the hardships he has on day to day just trying to get by with parkinson's and he's like yeah no i fell the other day and i injured my hand his hands broken up and you know uh, i think it's called still yes a michael yes. j fox movie yeah that was 2023 yeah, it was, it was really good. It's Netflix, I think, is where it is. You can find it. Yeah, Rush Limbaugh oh, yes. is a piece of shit. Scumbag. <laughs> yes, yeah. Rush Limbaugh once accused Michael J. Fox of not taking his meds to accentuate his condition. Yes, because people do that. Yeah, yeah. yeah people, people, people enjoy actually, suffering. People actually like sit home and think, gee, how can I? Well, see, I'm about to say that. So I was about to say, yeah, because people sit at home and think, like, how can I gain more sympathy? Let me not take my meds. And then I just thought of Jesse Smollett. <laughs> it's like, Ooh, yeah, oh. yeah, yeah. Was... some people do. Some people do. <laughs> that was really bad. Oh, it's like, oh, bro, you your not, career. you've not helped anybody. And the worst part, this man was talented. Yeah. Oh, he yeah. He could sing. He could act. He was on, like, the one of the most entertaining shows on tv i mean mm -hmm. and he, he took he took down everybody else yeah he did because when that career when when he blew up his career the show lasted like one more season and, that, and everybody else that, it was that a had shame. a job with that show just they I all mean, lost, it, ended up losing their jobs too right it, it was a very dark show <laughs> It was a very dark show. I loved it though. It was good though, but it was it was dark in the way that um, Sons of Anarchy or Breaking Bad were. But yeah. this was about the music industry. And I think it was an accurate depiction of the music industry that nobody seems to even know about. <laughs> mm -hmm. The one part, you know, the one part on that show I wish would have happened is like right in the first season they had Courtney Love in for one episode. Mm. I didn't this, see that one. Oh, it was really good. And I really, really thought that at some point they would bring her back for something because mm -hmm. they'd like just kind of left her. And I thought, okay, you know, when you just leave someone in a show like that, at some point they just pop up and go, remember me? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they never, at least, I, I didn't get to watch the last season, but uh, up until the before uh, the last season, they had never brought her back. And I always had a feeling that they had written it with the intention of bringing her back somehow but i guess it just never happened yeah it looks like oh well all right enough talk about entertainment kits do you have something to start us off mr grizzly because uh something happened in ottawa yeah um <laughs> it, or didn't stuff. happen in ottawa well, depending on how you want to call it i've got some footage here just give me a sec i'm just trying to uh trying to save a photo here for later um but I, I i did get some footage i saw some footage i didn't gather footage i saw footage here online that i looked at and went hmm i don't i don't really want to show it because um to be honest with you it's kind of amplifying it's not entirely truthful okay the footage that i've seen it, it's it's showing a, a story without giving you the background and the background is it's it's convoluted and complex now it's terrible people doing terrible things yes and toronto dan's talking about it yeah that's what i'm what toronto dan has here in his comment and this is the footage i have of her getting roughed up but what we don't see is the footage of her creating the horrible scene that created her getting roughed up did she deserve to get roughed up no uh, she, nobody does, but the freedom crowd is, you know, they're all about freedom unless it's somebody else's. Admittedly, she is a, a an agitator and it seems to appear at every single protest there is. So I'm like, I don't know how she earns a living. I'm not judging the person. I don't know a damn thing about her, but I've heard uh, different stories from different people. So I'm not going to pass judgment on her because I don't know enough about her, but I've heard her say some pretty terrible things about uh, our friend Dan, 
which is not cool. And Dan does mm. have some stories about her. Karima has uh, got some footage of her agitating people. And oftentimes she'll bring her daughter to these things where she's agitating people. So uh, it's really questionable. So I really don't want to show the footage and I'm not going to, because I okay. don't want to amplify something that I don't really have enough knowledge or, or facts to, to get into and delve into. But they showed up in my city again. And I say my city because I live, work, and pay taxes here. They don't. They paraded around Parliament Hill, I think, for a couple hours on Saturday. They were supposed to have a concert and a barbecue. And I don't think any of that took place. I don't know. I was actually busy doing adult things, you know, house cleaning, chores, laundry, dishes, yeah. vacuuming, dusting, organizing some, some accounts, uh, doing some editing, you know. Things with the people who have jobs tend to do on the weekend. Right. But I was also working as well because, you know, this, this job never stops. But I, I, I looked up at the Parliament Hill webcam a couple of times and said, oh, yeah, there's about, I don't know, maybe 150 people up there. Maybe, if that. And somebody said, yeah, don't confuse everyone on the hill with the convoy. Uh, Winterlude. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's true. Winterlude is on uh, Spark Street. And Saturday was a beautiful sunny day. So there were a lot of people out. It was cold on Saturday, but it was sunny. So there were a lot of people out. Uh, yesterday, it started off very cold in the morning, but it, it got quite mild in the afternoon. And there was yeah. quite a few people out on Spark Street. And I went down and checked it out. And, and they were handing out free chocolate and, and apple cider, which was nice. Hot, hot apple cider. Nice. Uh, Tim Hortons was handing out either free coffee or free chocolate. And the NCC was handing out free apple cider. There was uh, busker shows. And uh, I guess Saturday afternoon or Saturday evening, there was a drag show that I missed. I didn't, I didn't even know about it. I, I would have went to see it and support, you know, support the local community. Uh, but I didn't, I didn't, uh, I didn't get to that. We were, <laughs> we had other plans, you know. Okay. Went to, went to okay. the Carlton Tavern to, uh, to see a band. Um, we stayed for one set and then left. We were, 9 30 we're walking back to to bridget's uh, bridget's house and we're looking at one another and i'm like i just want to go to bed she's like me too i'm like 9 30 on a saturday there's no crowd rolling in i want to go to bed <laughs> so i went to bed at 9 30 on a saturday oh uh, that's good um apparently they had a, a little bit of fireworks there was some reporting on the web that mm -hmm. I know, did there see. was some policemen that were there and then kind of like disappeared again Yes, yeah, just before um, the fireworks. Yeah, a couple of arrests and stuff. Um, they got it was pretty hold, uneventful for the most part. Yeah, they got hold of um, a lot of people. Think that it was the National Press Gallery itself uh, because they had oh, a, for their press conference on Friday. Yeah, they had their press conference. Um, it it wasn't. The National Press Gallery, um, specifically, um, it's somebody uh, put a fact check on that because for the National Press Gallery, you need to be sponsored by a, an MP of some kind, and they were wondering, you know, it's like, well, which MP gave them permission for that? And uh, it's an account to Stuart Benson who's a reporter for the Hill Times, uh, gave a little fact check on that, said it's not the National Press Theater, it's the 135B conference room in the Wellington building. Groups wishing to hold a press conference in the latter do not need an MP sponsor to use 135B, and the only major restriction is the topic needs to be related to federal politics. Um, and uh, he posted this, Mr. Grizzly, uh, that I'm going to share with you here. I'd have to blow that up for the kids, however. Stuart Benson does some really good work, by the way. Mm -hmm. um, and he's showing the difference here. Uh, 135B is on the left, and the National Press Theater is on the right. Hang on a sec. We've got some nonsense going on here in the background. I was getting well, noise from somewhere. I didn't know if it was from you, if it was from you. It was clearly from me. I, I just, I have a quick, uh, go, uh, yeah, let me show you uh, the thing you just put. Sorry, I was thrown for a minute. I was hearing something in my headset and I'm like, what is that coming from? Here we are. So this is so, from Stuart uh, Benson. So the National Press Theater is on the right 
Mm -hmm. You can recognize it because it has desks, it has chairs, and it has all Canadian I've done work and in black that. background. Mm -hmm. And the 135B has a podium and has the flags of all the provinces as well as the Canadian flag. So that's how you can tell the difference between them just visually. Mm -hmm. Right. Oh, he says, got his buildings backwards. Sorry. So minus points all around. 135B is in the West Block. National Press Theater is in the Wellington Building, actually. So they were in the West Block, which is now the House of Commons. Yeah. Because Center Block has moved to West Block until Center Block gets the renovation done. So that would have been sponsored by an MP. Well, this one isn't. 135B isn't. Well, is, didn't he just say that's in the West Block? Yes, but it still that doesn't change the thing. It says uh, groups wishing to hold a press conference in 135B don't need an MP to sponsor. These. Oh, okay. The only major restriction is that the topic needs to be related to federal politics. Right, and they have to pass security clearance yes. to get into the building. Yeah, but for the national, well, the not security clearance, but just the security check. Mm -hmm. right? They can't have like weapons or anything. Right, right, right of course. Whereas right. the National Press Theater itself, then you do need to be sponsored by an MP for that. So, um, yeah, exactly, Linda, Kitlandam, if that's how you get on camera, then Douglas and Paul, you should do a podcast there. It would be a lot more informational and beneficial. <laughs> Thanks, you know, maybe we will. <laughs> Welcome to the Daily Beaver Morning Show, live from the 135V. <laughs> on the West Block of Parliament Hill. This is, uh, I, this is the crowd that was on the Parliament, uh, on Parliament Hill during the, uh, the height of it, I guess, the height, I don't know what you want to call it. It's not a big crowd. Um, there might be 200 people there. And again, the question is how many of them are just people attending, uh, winter loot? Yeah. I don't know. It's, okay. it's not a big crowd at all. Wow. No, 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 definitely not a big crowd, which again, you know, it's, uh, they're convinced that they're the majority, but they're in an yeah. echo chamber. Yeah. Not at all. Not at all. I stopped, I stopped in on the way home yesterday because I spent the night at Bridget's and I took the train home and I stopped off at uh, a store on Spark Street and went in to, to just look around. I was looking for a couple of things and they didn't have what I wanted, but I did notice a few people uh, parading around, uh, a couple, um, and one of them had a toucan that said, let's go, Brandon. I'm like, y you know, you're in the wrong country, right? <laughs> I didn't say that. I just locked eyes with them and just shook my head and walked away. I'm like, uh, uh, you're in the wrong country. <laughs> I bet you they're protesting. About, where's my Fifth Amendment? No, 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 no. I'm, no. You can't plead the Fifth. We don't have that. No, we don't have that. Uh, so yeah, all of that happened, and uh, once again, you know, they're still stuck in 2021 and 2022, while the rest of the world has moved on and. They're still claiming that they live in some type of tyrannical country, uh, despite the fact that they got to walk up to 135B and use it and be broadcast from coast to coast to coast on CPAC. Mm. Yeah. Got to go on national television, sponsored. You know what? And, you know, let's, let's go back to bitch about the government. And nobody came to their door or rounded them up, and they're not in some, you know, work camp prison mm -hmm. near alert, <laughs> breaking rocks. So, but yes, tyranny. It's telling us that uh, that we live in a dictatorship. Meanwhile, they they were on Parliament Hill in the West Block, spewing yeah. their garbage. Yeah. Let's revisit this. Seriously, let's revisit this. What? What's on the screen right now from Lindsay? To, to, to go to 135B one morning? If that's how you get on camera, then Douglas and Paul should do a podcast there. It would be a lot more information and beneficial. You know what? That's not a ridiculous idea. If anybody can do it and it has to do with federal politics, why not? I'm not sure we would get an hour, though. But <laughs> How much time could we get? I don't know. Well, let's see if we can find out and do it. Or I'm science. Game. <laughs> I'm game. Why not? Right? I'm game yeah. to do it. That seems some guy named uh, Claude Contois got arrested, which seemed to generate. Uh, Joe Moray uh, reported that. And it seems that uh, there was a lot of uh, yay, yay, yays. And somebody asked, Is Dina all right? And did she go by Dina or Deanna? I don't know. I've never met her. Yeah. 
and uh, apparently he says she is fine <laughs> i don't know again i i hear all these believe what to believe i don't know i know that that she and dan have had some conflict i don't know exactly what i know that it's not it's not been nice it's not been kind and a lot of things have been pointed out to me i think she's uh, a professional agitator yes i don't know the person so but but she shows up at every single thing so um, okay uh, you know it just makes me suspect is all yeah so don't you have time to you know don't you have to work sometime or don't you have to you know do life things like i i don't know i don't know the person maybe she's independently wealthy i have no idea yeah so um we had some really interesting juxtaposition because while they were there screaming tyranny yeah. meanwhile so, in uh, russia yeah we found out that alexei navalny died and it wasn't so much air quotes, died air quotes died he was murdered. He was murdered by Vladolf Putler. Mm -hmm. And um, we had reaction from our leaders. Mm -hmm. And we'll get to that. Yeah. But here's something that happened. Uh, Mr. Grizzly, if you will put this up here. Just the visual. I don't know. I don't think we need any sound. But okay. Bear with me. people in Moscow had lined up to lay flowers for Navalny. That was the only arrested. form of protest that they were allowed. And yet, even though they were technically allowed, over 300 mm -hmm. were arrested for coming over to lay flowers. Yeah, you want to hear about a real dictatorship, my friends? That's it. And you want to hear about courage? Yeah. That's courage. Yeah, oh yeah. And this doing it knowing that something terrible is going to happen to you. And you do it anyway. That's courage when you have reason to be afraid and you do it anyway. Yeah. And it led uh, to this moment here, Mr. Grizzly, that I will send you uh, something else. And um, this is one person who is beyond brave. Uh, and you know, when you hit a, moment in your country when things are literally going to pot um and you have no more fucks left to give sorry yeah, for the language yeah. I don't know, I hear you. and uh, you start speaking out and there was one citizen who did on camera and told it like it is um, I've not heard anything yet about whether this person has been rounded up, but I, I am no pretty sure that in an actual dictatorship, if you do this, you're probably never heard from again. Yeah, Especially if you do it on camera. This is a, a pensioner who survived the siege of Leningrad. And they went to the rally and they just let fly. They served up a whole lot of tea. A whole lot of tea, yeah. Kid James, Trump and Tucker are very quiet about Navalny's death. Yeah, you've noticed that. Very 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 quiet and also your comment things are so toxic right now that if justin trudeau died the convoy would celebrate i do not doubt that one minute you know you're you're probably right about that okay now i've got it it took me a minute there to get that lined up because the uh there were other things playing in the background but <clears throat> what? 
one of the things about this new computer I've noticed is that I can have 30 things running at the same time and it doesn't choke it <laughs> at all. So videos just start playing on their own. So I'm hearing stuff, but I can't tell which tablet a tab has the, the sound because it's not showing me the speaker for some reason. And usually you can just reach up and hit mute on the speaker, but it wasn't doing that for some bizarre reason. So yep. here I have, um, this is uh, not a young woman. I think she's nope. in her 80s, I believe. And this is what she has to say. And we'll just put this on the screen here for you to watch. So yeah, she doesn't give a damn. No, she stopped uh, giving a damn. So uh, for people who are listening at home, uh, because in English there were subtitles, uh, this person said, enough blood, enough hate, enough of all of this. He killed the children in Ukraine. How many of our soldiers died? How many Ukrainian ones? They're lying. More than 300,000 of our soldiers were killed. Doesn't he feel sorry? They are not afraid of blood. They do not fight themselves. They have profit from this war. How many billionaires appeared during this war? Mm. He's a traitor to our country. A traitor. Putin, who makes slaves out of people. He has illegitimate power. No one elected him. I Should consider really them non-humans. They are non-humans. They were really wives without husbands, mothers without sons, children without fathers. He doesn't feel sorry. He doesn't fight himself. I'm not afraid. I'm already many years old. They can only kill me. She doesn't care. She's got nothing left to give. Yeah. Why are we listening to him? There are 140 million of us. Can't we really stand up and say, get out of here, you carrion? I don't know what carrion means. Uh, I, you know what? I said the same thing, so I'm about to learn a new word. <laughs> it gets <laughs> carrion, the decaying flesh of dead animals. Ooh, yee. That's as bad as toe rag. I love how, how senior, senior women have come up with the best insults with very polite sounding words he's a filthy toe rag not a rag you put between your toes do you know what a toe rag is i do not know i'm about to learn another word i will tell you what a toe rag is t-o-w rag it was a rag tied to a rope that was thrown over the side of a ship back in the old days and when you needed to um relieve yourself you would sit on the side of the ship and uh, defecate into the ocean and then pull the toe rag up and wipe yourself with it and then throw it back into the ocean on the rope. A toe rag. Filthy toe rag. Oh my. Yeah. Carry on and filthy toe rag. I, I like carry on. I'm going to use that. Wow. Thank you to the senior ladies for teaching me new things. See, we can learn from our elders. And there's a third word I learned today. Oh. Kakisto kakistocracy. Kakistocracy, yes. Kakistocracy, okay. Government by the least suitable or competent citizens of a state. Mm -hmm. Hello, PP. 
Yeah. And we have a, you, you just sent me a video a minute ago. Yes. This is uh, um, a guy who I see often on Twitter uh, make statements. I'd like to connect with him, actually. Yeah. He seems like a good dude. He looks so cool. <laughs> okay. <laughs> the visual, right? If you're judging a book by its cover, and a lot of people do when they see him, it's like, what does a guy with a beard like that have to do with say anything with politics? We don't it's like, it. did you listen to it with the sound up? Yeah, exactly. Did you turn the sound up? <laughs> Maybe listen. Maybe listen. Maybe listen. This is uh, this is another case of do not judge the book by its cover. Yeah, I would assume that this guy. I would assume he's either like a hardcore skater, or like loves like thrash metal or punk or something. <laughs> Probably, I, I can I definitely see Slayer in his uh, his listening uh, cue. Yeah, I could be wrong, but, but he is aware. Oh yeah, I've seen him a lot. Yeah. Um, let's let's run let's let's roll let's roll the tape as the old boys yes. used to say back in the day well let's roll the tape there is no tape it's just a digital file but have a look at this so this week marks the death of alexei navalny this gentleman seen here who is vladimir putin's main political opponent he died abruptly under pretty mysterious circumstances in the arctic penal colony he was serving a 19-year sentence in he was con or imprisoned here because he's a political opponent of Vladimir Putin. And he was imprisoned after he returned to Russia, knowing he would be imprisoned, after Russia tried to kill him with a nerve agent on an international flight. Leaders around the world have expressed their condolences and put out statements on Twitter. I would like to cover the three Twitter statements the three leaders of Canada's main political parties have put out because I find they're quite telling as to the type of people they are, uh, that who wrote them are. Here's Justin Trudeau's statement. Reports of Alexei Navalny's death are tragic and horrifying. An unwavering advocate for Russian democracy and freedom. His courage was unparalleled. To be clear, he should never have been imprisoned to begin with. Let this be an important reminder that we must continue to promote, protect, and defend democracy everywhere. The consequences of not doing so are stark. I'm sending my deepest condolences to Alexei Navalny's family and to all those around the world who had championed his pursuit of justice. Canada remains committed to holding Putin responsible for his actions. A nice strong statement condemns his imprisonment and his death, expresses empathy and condolences, and reminds people how important it is to keep democracy alive. Here's Jagmeet Singh's response. I am saddened by reports that Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has died in prison. Navalny's important work exposed corruption by Putin officials and he was killed for it. My thoughts are with his, or his loved ones and with all political prisoners targeted by Putin. Again, a pretty strong statement. Calls out Putin directly for being responsible for this man's murder talks about his imprisonment for political reasons, etc. So what did Mr. Pierre Polyev put out? Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has died in prison. And notice he spelled the guy's name wrong. Putin imprisoned Navalny for the act of opposing the regime. Conservatives condemn Putin for his death. And I'd like to note that apparently conservatives only condemn Putin for his death not for his unjust imprisonment, just for being a political opponent. And they didn't really say that Putin killed him or murdered him. Just he died in prison and, you know, we condemn that death. That is the softest, weakest fucking statement from any political leader on this situation. And I just find that so telling of Pierre Polyev's complete lack of character and complete lack of empathy. The reason why I uh, opted to play this clip is because I would have come on the show, I would have read the three statements, and I probably would have said the exact same thing mm -hmm. in a similar way. So why not just show somebody saying it? <laughs> um, there's nothing more to add. No. In one sense, that's pretty much it. But some people did add stuff. So we have a uh, Luc Lebrun from Press Progress, who, by the way, uh, Luc Lebrun uh, received a shout out from the Hill Times 
as being a, a very, very, very important influencer, one of the top 100, you know, those top 100 lists. And yeah, he was on it, which was very, 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 very well deserved because mm-hmm. Press Progress is a media along with the National Observer that definitely deserves your financial support if you're going to subscribe to something. Uh, and he said, Polyev's entire election strategy hinges on keeping kooky PPC voters in his tent, which is probably why this statement lacks the colorful rhetoric we are so used to seeing from this account. And that's true because my first instinct was it's indeed very interesting to see that the man who was outraged by everything had such a tepid response to Navalny's murder. Then again, this is also the man who, when he applauded, because he did stand up and applaud for Yaroslav Hunka, when he thought he was a war hero, well, his applause was also, also equally tepid. Oh, I mean, I think it has to do with this, maybe, you think. Michael Deatter's um, political cartoon. Yep. Dear Polyev, we have our reasons for voting against helping Ukraine. As he sits, uh, he's a puppet on the hand of Vladimir Putin, who is, I don't know, sipping on a vodka on a chair. Yes, ventriloquism. Yes. Basically, ventriloquist dummy. Um, but then we had uh, Bruce Arthur. Mm-hmm. From the, uh, the Toronto Star. It says, Pierre Polyev is outraged by everything. Why was he so uncharacteristically and strangely muted at the death of Alexei Navalny? And by the way, uh, Polyev cared so much, so, 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 so much about this issue that, uh, Mr. Grizzly, if you will uh, put this up. Now, I'm not suggesting that Pierre Polyev writes his own tweets. Mm hmm. Because usually I have people for that. Um, but notice Alexei spelled A L E X E Y mm-hmm. instead of E I. Mm-hmm. Because he cared so much, he couldn't even get his name right. Yeah. 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 <sighs> lazy, lazy, lazy. So, Bruce Arthur, uh, I want to read this one into the record. Because, damn. Alexei Navalny's death. Where was Pierre Polyev's outrage at Putin? By Bruce Arthur, columnist, Saturday, February 17th in the Toronto Sun. Alexei Navalny could have been killed any time, really. In 2020, he was poisoned with the same Soviet-era substance Russia used when agents sprayed former spy Sergei Skripal and his daughter Yulia with a perfume bottle in Salisbury, England. Navalny emerged from a coma and survived. Navalny returned to Russia and was detained on arrival, sentenced on a flimsy charge, and he spent the rest of his life being shuttled between prison colonies until he landed in a grim facility called the Polar Wolf above the Arctic Circle. He may have been poisoned again, slowly. On Friday, Navalny, the most significant opposition politician in Russia, apparently fell ill after a walk, lost consciousness almost immediately, and died. He was 47. His death was a choice, just as Russia's war in Ukraine is a choice. Sorry. His death was a choice, just as Russia's war in Ukraine was and is a choice. Vladimir Putin saw to it that Navalny died without ever saying his name in public. Nobody was surprised. And amid the international condemnation in Canada, Conservative leader Pierre Polyev delivered a statement so dishwater gray, so thin and colorless and frankly strange that it stood out. Quote, Russian opposition leader Alexei Navalny has died in prison, Polyev wrote on the service formerly known as Twitter. Putin in prison, Navalny for the act of opposing the regime, conservatives condemn Putin for his death. If any major political leader made a weaker statement and there was a kaleidoscope of statements to choose from, it was hard to find. Some lower level conservatives were more direct. MP Garnet Genuous, there's a surprise, tweeted, quote, the despicable murder of Alexei Navalny by Vladimir Putin underlines what is at stake in the Ukraine war and more broadly in the global struggle between the democratic world and the anti-democratic world. We must rise to the challenge. Hmm, wonder if he's going to get whipped after that. Oh, I'm sure he will. That is much closer to the colorful, forceful language Polyev typically employs, and in fact has employed in the past, though almost not at all in the past year, but studiously avoided here. Polyev's muted response shouldn't be a shock so much as an alarm. Nobody is saying Polyev is is in Putin's pocket. We are. (laughs) We're not nobody. A lot of people are. Uh, The adder definitely is. Oh, yeah. Right? So we can't say that nobody is. But let's just go with it here. 
Nobody is saying Poliev is in Putin's pocket. Nobody is saying he or Canada's conservatives are as aligned with Putin as Donald Trump or House Republicans who might lose the war for Ukraine by cutting off military support. This is far more monstrous stuff. But Canada's conservative movement is sliding in that direction, and it's not hidden, really. It may not even be that complicated. Canada's federal conservatives clearly feel the need to pull in votes from the People's Party of Canada, the far-right bouillabaisse of anti-vaccine, anti-lockdown, anti-immigrant, anti-LGBTQ, pro-Trump conspiracy-embracing views. Poliev's embrace of the convoy was a seminal part of his leadership. He has since pushed an anti-vaccine mandate bill and weighed in on the side of anti-trans legislation. And as it happens, that bouillabaisse is disproportionately pro-Russia, which is likely not a coincidence. But as happens with radicalization, things spread. This month, an Angus Reid poll asked him that the government was doing too much for Ukraine and the percentage of conservative voters who agreed has more than doubled since March 2022 from 19 to 43 percent, as previously reported on this show. There is a general numbing to the war in Ukraine, a fatigue, but the conservative voters' numbers is about four times higher than those of the NDP and liberal voters. In that light, Polyev's statements is perhaps best read as a reading of his intended audience. When conservatives were the only party to vote against the Canada-Ukraine trade deal, they had to flatly invent their own reality in order to justify it. They claimed the bill imposed a carbon tax on Ukraine, which was like claiming the bill imposed a war on Ukraine. Not only does the bill do not do that, but Ukraine itself noted it has had a carbon tax since 2011. Podyev put out several strong statements on Ukraine between February and October of 2022, but of late, seems to have had less to say on the subject. He who has something to say about everything. That was my personal note. When the conservatives wanted Canada to send a store of mothballed CRV-7 missiles to Ukraine, it's not clear the missiles can be transported safely or even useful, but Ukraine wants them, so send them, sure. The Conservatives did it through a press release to the Parliamentary Press Gallery, which is not a place every Conservative supporter finds their news, and online MPs Michael Chong and James Bazan tweeted about it. Podiev never did. The FTSE with Russia-leaning Conservatives isn't limited to the federal level, either. Fox host Tucker Carlson, who has openly admired Russia in the recent past, was invited to Alberta earlier this year to sit with Premier Daniel Smith and National Post columnist Conrad Black and Jordan Peterson. Peterson, in particular, has been boosted by Polyev many times. But then Carlson went directly to Russia to produce propaganda so low-rent and servile that Putin made fun of them. His dispatches from a Moscow supermarket where Carlson was amazed by the shopping cart technology that involved putting a coin into the cart as a deposit. <sighs> you should have come to Canada way earlier, dude. Echoed decades of useful idiots shilling for the motherland. So we, we've had that, and it has disappeared. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Yeah, that's 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 hilarious. Yes, and uh, about that too, uh, you have a uh, you know Tucker Carlson going, "Wow, we could get a whole basket of groceries for one hundred and seventy dollars." You do realize also that in Russia you make about a thousand dollars a month. Yeah, let's let's ignore that. Let, let's ignore the price of food relative to your income, because that kind of matters when you're talking about being able to buy stuff. Right. Again, personal note. It can all come off as farce, but it's deadly serious. What happens if the West folds on Ukraine or Taiwan after that, and maybe Moldova or Finland next? What happens if Canada elects a government that invents reality to placate supporters who are becoming increasingly out there and increasingly Trump-friendly? Polyev already shares Trump's instinct to delegitimize honest media. Putin was way out front on that. Every party makes room for its most energized and deranged supporters. It just so happens that this version of the federal conservatives is not just tolerating that wing, but embracing them, and perhaps becoming them. Sorry, I have to cough. <clears throat> you can go ahead and do that. It's 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 it's, it's per- perfectly permissible. Yes. Sorry, um, I for- I coughed before I pressed the cough button. That's <laughs> okay. It happens. <laughs> Perfectly on Friday, two representatives of the Freedom Convoy held a press conference on Parliament Hill and complained in light of the recent federal court decision on the use of the Emergencies Act that, quote, our police were weaponized, our justice system was weaponized against our people, and historically that has not done very well when a leader against a group he disagrees with in a country uses violence to suppress them. It's a very slippery slope, and if you watched our Friday episode, you know that what they just said there did not happen in that courtroom. Exactly. The judge never said that the police was weaponized and that the justice system was weaponized against the people. At all. He said that there were some minor things that have to have been done just a little differently. Mm. 
mm-hmm. would not be unconstitutional. He didn't say those things couldn't be done. So they just weren't done in the right way. So, you know. The, um, it's amazing how these people who are all instant constitutional scholars <laughs> cannot read the word, you know, they'll read the word, it, it's a lovely sunny day, and they'll say, a tornado's coming. Do you not understand the meaning of the word sunny? No. no. Day. <laughs> Speaking of anyway. sunny day. Sunny yeah. day. <sighs> Jeez. Putin is who convoy supporters think Trudeau is. Putin is who Magaloons think Joe Biden is. And Putin somehow is why so many of them have come to admire. Sorry, let me try that again. And Putin some, somehow is who so many of them have come to admire. So Pierre Polyev gets to make Dishwater Week statement on global events and play footsie with this, some truly repellent ideas. But Polyev won't be sent to jail and he won't be killed. He might even win. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Bruce Arthur. Yes, no kidding. And on that subject, let's get to that uh, thing that we were talking about as the week ended uh, last week, because there was a Canadian family who decided to test that out. Yeah, and they're not very bright, are they? Uh, 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 yeah. Do you want to go to the video? I can bring up the video. Yes, please bring up the video if you have it. Yeah, get, bear with me for a sec here till I find it. It's in my bookmarks. I'll just go to my bookmarks. I, I, I watched the video and I'm like, I, I, oh man, wow. Yeah. <clears throat> so basically, and when you listen to the video, there's going to be two parts. There's going to be the part with um, the journalist who is actually reporting uh, it, which will be coming across loud and clear. And then there will be the part where the family's in a press conference and actually speaking about it, uh, which will be difficult to hear because it was recorded at a way lower volume. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so if you I can, uh, can't hear it. post production, but in the live one, I'll do the best I can. But in post, I'll be yeah. able to clean it. It might, it might not be clear. Um, do you have it ready, Mr. Grizzly? I do. Let's have a look at this uh, video. All right. Shall we? For those of you who haven't seen this, because Dean featured this last week as well. And I yes. thought we should feature it because, well... For the folks who seem to think moving to Russia will solve all your problems because of the dictatorship that you believe you are, you falsely believe you were living in in Canada, watch this. Today, let's talk about a Canadian family that has eight children that sold everything they had in Canada and moved to Russia. The Arendt Feistry family, I hope I pronounced that correctly, moved to Nizhny Novgorod region of the Russian Federation a month ago from Canada to raise their eight children in the spirit of orthodox values away from the LGBTQ plus community. Well, Canada is not the same country it used to be, and we didn't feel safe for our children there in the future anymore. There's a lot of uh, left left-wing ideology, LGBTQ, trans, um, just a lot of things that we don't agree with that they teach there now, and we wanted to get away from that for our children. Also, for economic reasons, for farming, better opportunities, uh, we felt Russia was best. Uh, Russia also has uh, the strength to stand up against Western pressures, and um, yeah, I, I think it'll stand on its own, and it'll keep that stuff away for many, many, many years. Other countries are under the Western influence and uh, wouldn't be able to stand up against it, I don't think. So, Why Nizhny Novgorod? It, it looks a lot like where we're from. It's got a similar climate, uh, lots of land, lots of opportunities, and the government is interested or tells us that they are very interested in uh, working with Western farmers and helping us to get established here. Today, the fam- Let's just pause that for a second now and, and, and take note of how the bias confirmation echo chamber that he's been living in or the echo chamber that he's been living in has brainwashed him into thinking that life would be better under an actual murderous dictator that is vladimir putin (sighs) it's not that there's a lack of data on this guy i mean he's been the leader of russia for like how long now yeah have access to all knowledge on planet earth in the palm of your hand and you still 
listen to bullshit and believe it. <laughs> okay, let's go. Families' accounts have been blocked. They have nothing to live on. And Feistre's wife has already declared her disappointment with Russia, Russian Federation Regional Media reported. It is reported that the family moved to Russia to farm. Feinstra believes that there is a lot of good, cheap land here. In Canada, the family sold real estate and transferred the funds to a Russian account. The bank found the transfer suspicious as the Canadians were unable to justify the origin of the large sum in time and it blocked their accounts. In addition, few bank and government employees understand English well. Canadians have to communicate with them through machine translation, which complicates the process. Now the family has nothing to buy groceries with. Aaron's shared the details on his blog. He is still hoping to settle the matter, hoping that a workaround can be found to unblock the account. At the same time, in the comments, he is told that it is unlikely that he will succeed and it is more likely that he will be recognized as a foreign agent. Feistre's wife in the video puts it bluntly. Okay, that was really dumb. I'm very disappointed in this country at this point. I'm ready to jump on a plane and get out of here. We've hit the first snag where you have to engage logic in this country. And it's very, very frustrating. Well. <sighs> F-A-F-O. <laughs> F-A-F-O. And um, his wife, who is already making comments saying that she's disappointed in Putin. Yeah. I don't know if she's been following the news, but this guy's been in power close to 20 years mm -hmm. in two different terms. The little Medvedev in the middle there. And um, it's kind of common knowledge that it doesn't take too kindly to that kind of stuff. Any sort of criticism whatsoever. Yes. And uh, <clears throat> with that, We've been seeing stuff like this, uh, Mr. Grizzly, start to pop up. You want to blow that up a bit, sir? Please. Uh, if I blow it up a little more, I think it's gonna, not going to fully appear on the screen. Yeah. But here we go. Let's try that. <laughs> Mr. Grizzly, if you would. <laughs> it's okay. Sorry. Let me see if I can do this with a straight face. <clears throat> Russia wants to build a safe space for conservative Americans to move to. The village would also be open to Canadian conservatives upset by the politics in their country. I'll help you pack. Okay. Now, this is from uh, an outlet called The New Republic. Mm -hmm. I have no idea how <laughs> reputable this is. No idea. At all. Never heard from them. Um, it says... Russia is pining to build on its budding relationship with American conservatives, literally. This is from May 2023, mm. and it's getting popularity now because of this. Amid Russia's ongoing invasion of Ukraine and the American Republican Party splitting on its support for the defending nation, Russian authorities apparently are launching construction of a special village outside Moscow dedicated to conservative-minded Americans and Canadians. State outlet RIA Novosti reported the news Thursday. Timur Beslagurov, a Russian immigration lawyer, said the village would harbor the likes of some 200 families who want to emigrate for ideological reasons. That's not all, apparently. Beslagurov claims tens of thousands of people with no Russian roots would like to move to Russia. Quote, the reason is the inoculation of radical values. Today they have 70 genders. It is not known what will happen next, he said. The Russian lawyer claimed that some of those tens of thousands want to move to Russia because they are traditional Catholics who, quote, very strongly believe in the prophecy that Russia will remain the only Christian country in the world. And if you believe that Putin is a Christian, you've been reading the Bible wrong. Boy, do I, I, I have uh, about 100,000 acres of oceanfront property in northern Saskatchewan, right along the border with uh, the Northwest Territories for sale for you. Wonderful beach freight. Great price. Great price. 
beachfront property in northern Saskatchewan. Oh, no, no. Oceanfront <laughs> property. Oh, ocean. Oh, no. I, oh, I specifically yes, yes. said that intentionally. Okay. Ocean because front. Okay. Cool, cool. none of that is real. <laughs> According to the lawyer, the future expats would help fund the village. Yeah. By transferring all your money and having your accounts yeah. seized. It's just the same people were screaming bloody murder because 57 accounts got frozen. Well, not sorry. 57 people 57. had about 250 accounts yes. frozen. Yeah. Like this. They're selling their belongings and moving to Russia and putting all their financial assets in a Russian bank account. Mm-hmm. Let that sink in. I just, uh, people are, people are, you know, we live in, we live in a time with more access to knowledge than at any other time in human history. And yet people are choosing not to read actual information and have abandoned critical thinking to believe in the echo chamber they've been sitting in for Lord knows how long. Now people will say, you sit in an echo chamber too of liberal ideologies. No, no, I don't actually. I listen and I think critically and I also parse through different news sources. And yes, a lot of them are mainstream media because a lot of the alternative news sources that are out there are complete mouthpieces for right-wing hedge funds. If you're not following basic journalistic standards, you really shouldn't have time for the outcome. Well, I mean, come on. Fox News said that we're not a news organization, literally. Yeah, when they go to court and it's under oath and it counts, they say we're not actually news. Maybe you should believe them what they say when they're in court. <laughs> well, that was in regards to Sean Hannity and Tucker Carlson directly. Yep. Because they did have yes, a news they literally show. testified. They literally testified that nobody in their right mind would take what they had to say seriously. That's right. They did have an actual news show and an actual news department with, um, or what was his name? Yes. Uh, he left because he got fed up with, with the lies that they were telling. Because yes, I can't remember his name too. Yes, uh, he moved to, yes. He kind of yeah. had a Stone Phillips. Chris something? He had a Stone Phillips type vibe to him, right? What was his yes, name? Yes, he did. Oh, oh, darn it. He was he was good. Chris. Was it Chris? Chris something, but he moved. Chris Wallace. Oh, no, I wasn't thinking of him. I was thinking of another gentleman. Oh, I know Chris okay. Wallace left, but there was another gentleman, too, I was thinking of, whose name is escaping me. He did their uh, their evening newscast at, like, 6 p.m. Yeah. Uh, Fox. And Fox News' polling department, in particular, is very, 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 very good. Oh, yes. Yeah, yeah. In the news section. Very good. Um, but that's about the only two redeeming qualities. <laughs> so, so Fox News actually does news about one hour a day. Yes. They have to. <laughs> they, they legitimately have to, or they lose their license. The broadcast. Yes, but the rest of it? Uh. <laughs> the rest of it is not news. Yes. Uh, Beslandrurov's remarks manifesting from lazing in an armchair and letting late-night fruitcake programming blare mindlessly at you mirror the broader posturing of Russia's government as, quote, traditional in comparison to the West's supposed loose liberalism. The red-in-the-face finger pointing at America has led to some pretty exaggerated propaganda in the past. On the other hand, Americans are in fact expressing increased desire to flee to the United States, not because there are 70 genders or too many vegetarians, but because of relentless and widespread attacks on abortion rights and LGBTQ people's civil rights. Conversely, Russia's own traditional posture, and you can believe that those people who want to live in the United States do not have Russia on their destination card. Canada, they do, <laughs> however. If we think we have a problem, housing problem now, Wait until about 70, 70 million Americans decide to cross over. Yeah, we got a major <laughs> problem then. <laughs> Claiming political asylum. Stack them, pack them, and rack them. I mean, yeah. where, where are you going to put conversely, them? Russia, yeesh, conversely, Russia's own traditional posturing has resulted in policies like policing the, quote, demonstration of LGBTQ behavior, banning Russians from suggesting that being gay is normal, and outlawing all form of media that could be seen as promoting such propaganda. Violations of the law could incur punishments of up to $33,000 in fines while non-residents could be expelled from Russia. None of this includes the growing crackdown on free speech, especially when it comes to criticism of the government and the invasion of Ukraine. Not a very warm environment for non-Russians to move to. Shepard Smith. Bear. Oh, yes. Shepard Smith. That's who I was thinking of. He had a unique name. Yes. He was good. Yes. Yes. So, yeah. Um... So, yeah, if this little village is being considered, it seems there is going to be a Canada town neighborhood. (laughs) 
Yeah, that'll work out well. Oh, man. Hey, listen. It's Canada. You have a constitutional right to be wrong. Yeah. Oh, yeah. It's allowed. I'm... <laughs> but, oh, boy. Uh, yeah, and when we're talking brainwashing, we're not talking, you know, like, you know, Putin has rounded you up and strapped you in a chair clockwork, clockwork orange style and they'll force you to watch stuff. And But, man, there are some people that are really willing to, it's like X-Files, I want to believe. I want to believe that Canada is tyrannical. I want to believe that Putin is better. Mm-hmm. I just want to. <sighs> so, this family that moved, one of the reasons why they really wanted to move is because, well, we were becoming a little too gay. Yeah, too woke, too left, too radical gender too ideology, too which is not a thing. Rainbow friendly. Um, which has led to uh, Pierre Polyev. He came out a little bit earlier on it in favor of Daniel Smith, what she is doing, and which prompted Theo to uh, create that cartoon mm-hmm. with Daniel Smith as uh, Dr. Evil. With her mini-me. Like this, with Pierre Polyev saying, "He's my, I call him my mini-me. And that's pretty much, we said, the moment where the leadership of the Canadian conservative movement went from Pierre Polyev to Daniel Smith. Well, he doubled down on that. Oh, I missed that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. He definitely doubled down on that because uh, there was an article that appeared in the National Post over the course of the weekend that said... um, Reporting on some polling results. Nearly half of Canadians support banning surgery and hormones for trans kids exclusive poll. I did see that. So it seems that Post Media and Leger 360 decided to do a poll on what Canadians thought of the measures in Daniel Smith's new guidelines, which is something I personally think should not have been done. Now, I understand this is freedom of expression mm-hmm. and all that kind of stuff, and you can do all that kind of stuff, but um, when you start conducting polls on the subject of do you think some Canadians deserve or do not deserve basic fundamental rights? Yeah. Like access to health care that they might need. You start legitimizing that. There's a reason we have a charter the constitution it's to protect the minority from the tyranny of the majority this is a, a real thing by the way so when you do things like australia did have like the whole country just to vote on whether in a referendum on whether or not the indigenous people should have more rights and be recognized people that have no skin in the game people that are not going to be affected by the decision mm-hmm. the things are less likely to pass yeah, the ugliness comes out then right yeah, you don't. You popular opinion does not factor in to whether basic fundamental human rights for some are recognized and for others are not. It should not, and we should not be polling on that, and we should not be publishing results from people who choose to poll on that. Well, I'm not saying there ought to be a law because we'd have freedom of expression, but. You should be looking at that with a whole lot of side eye. Because exactly as Kit Linda M said, if we start going down that path, should we also do a poll on whether diabetics should have access to insulin or whether or not smokers should get surgery. Get access One. to health care. Yeah. It, it even came up during the pandemic, right? When the hospitals were overflowing. Maybe we should do some triage. Ask people, did you get vaccinated yet? And if you hadn't, and then you come in with COVID, well, sorry, you go to the back of the mm-hmm. line. We're going to take care of people who did get vaccinated and still caught it first. And the convoy crowd got really mad at people who were suggesting that. Well, you know. They're saying we, they should just let us die. Blah, 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 well, blah, then get your vaccination. But, 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 fast forward to about a year and a half later. 
there's a minority of people who feel that they need these medical services that have been studied for many, many years and that medical professionals agree are okay and that are done in the safest way possible. Mm -hmm. Oh, no, 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 no. They can't have that. It's the exact same principle. It is. But because it's them. Yeah, it's funny how that oh, just takes no, no, a no, whole no. new thing, right? But if it's us, oh, no, no, how dare you say that we should be put in the back of the line because we didn't get vaccinated and now we caught COVID and we need to have an intubator? Well, look, here's the thing. The first thing they do is take the rights away and they will make it illegal for anyone to transition at some point. They will take a woman's right to make a, a medical choice about her body. They will ban abortion. Polyev apparently has said so much in private that he's on the side of banning abortion. I have read statements from people who said they've heard him say it. I don't know if it's true, but it wouldn't surprise me. Nope. So what comes after that? Well, first they'll put an end to that. So first they'll, they'll, they'll make it illegal for people to transition at any age. Then they'll make it illegal for a woman to have an abortion. Then they'll take away contraception. Then, once they've got that taken care of, they'll end same-sex marriage. And how soon till they start making you wear an armband, like a pink armband, to identify that you're rainbow? You think I'm being ridiculous? This has happened before, and it can happen again. I'm not being alarmist. I'm being factual. This has happened before. It can happen again. And in many cases, it's happening right now. Yep. So, no, well, yeah, we have Kid James going. I don't think any of those things are going to happen. Um, well, if we can have I, any say in it, I, I would, they won't. I would love your optimism, but there's a reason why we say democracy is an everyday job. Yes. I hope none of those things happen. I hope none of those things happen. Do I think none of those things will happen? If you would have asked me two years ago, I would have said impossible. Mm -hmm. You ask me now, I don't think impossible. Because two years ago, we didn't have rabid hordes of people deciding to show up at schools mm -hmm. and protest and offering free merch to kids. I'm just... Um, well, here's the thing, I'm, and, and this, I'm, in this statement, states in the U.S. are trying yeah. to do some of those things, including outlawing same-sex marriage and banning rainbow people from adopting children. Look, they've already in they've already ended a woman's right to make a choice. In Texas, they're now trying to make it, now that they've banned abortion there, they're trying to also make it a crime to, if you live in Texas, to go out of state to get yes. one. Yes, yeah. No. Yeah. So. Now they're, they're, they're these restricting are your freedom of movement. Yes. What's because next? you said, okay, I can't get it in my state. I'll go somewhere else for those who can. I said, oh, no, 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 you can't do that either. What, what's now. next? Tattoos? Piercings? I know I sound alarmist, but there's a reason for it. This has happened before, and it can happen again if we are not ever vigilant. I'm not being ridiculous. Look at what happened in Florida. Look at what's happening in Texas. This can happen especially if we don't pay attention as to how these folks get into positions of power to make these changes. They start by becoming school board trustees. They start with book banning. They start with ending uh, GSAs. And the next thing you know, they're running for city council. Next thing you know, they're the mayor. There's no pipe parade. And then they're into provincial politics and then federal. And the next thing you know, Women can't have an abortion. Men can't buy contraceptives. Women are not allowed contraceptives. It, this can all happen. The Handmaid's Tale was not a piece of fiction in the sense that it was written about things that were actually taking place around the world at the time when Margaret Atwood wrote the book. Or things that have happened in history. Correct. Because uh, everything in that book is something that has, that has happened at some place at some point. I mean, in Uganda, they're back to executing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thanks to the Christian right who went there. You know, they're back to executing gay people back thanks to the Christian right. And it's like, I, I know that 
the thing is, is that it's unlikely to happen here. People have that that safety. It's like I understand that you're worried, but don't worry. That that this is Canada. It's unlikely to happen here. It happens, and it happens rather quickly. That's this is the thing. It's like I I I love your optimism, James. I do. I really do. It is unlikely to happen here if we stay engaged and make sure it doesn't. And being feeling like it is unlikely to happen makes one not be vigilant mm-hmm. enough. And then when it happens, they're usually the first ones to go, oh my God, I'm surprised it happened here. And then while everybody else is going, we weren't. So I wouldn't get too comfortable. I wouldn't be too secure in the knowledge that it's unlikely to happen here because it really doesn't. Let's put it this way. It's easier to make happen than a lot of people think that it is. And just because it hasn't happened here for a long time. I mean, it wasn't that long ago that a certain amount of certain second of our population had people knocking on their doors and taking their kids away. The 60s scoop. It happened. It happened right. here and it happened in, in Australia as well. It, it wasn't that long ago that they were searching out the public service for civil servants that were gay and strapping them to machines. And it was also illegal to be gay at the time. And measuring whether or not their pupils were dilating when it showed certain images mm-hmm. and that type of stuff to see whether or not they were gay. There were people that got thrown out of the military. It wasn't that, you know, we think it's long ago, but it wasn't that long ago. No. There are people alive that know that feeling. It wasn't that long ago. Well, and. And if that was put, and if it was put to a vote, or to a referendum, or we were doing public opinion surveys, it would have had support. Indeed. Well, look at Cassie's statement here. Brandon Leslie, MP for Portage, Manitoba, ran on an anti-abortion, anti-trans platform and won. And, and I agree with James here. Sixty percent of Canadians want to protect abortion rights, but all of those rights and LGBTQ issues, the percentage changes when specifically talking about children. I, I believe, which is why they always talk about yes, children. Yes. The, the, the vast majority of centrist and progressive Canadians, which is what the vast majority is, wants to protect the rights that have been fought for and hard-won battles to get those rights. And they don't want them to slip away. The thing is, if the people are doing things at uh, incremental levels in the background, slowly stripping away, and you don't realize it until it's gone, it's, it's like to say, first they came for the trade unionists, and I did not stand up because I was not a trade unionist. It's how it happens. So I'm saying be ever vigilant. I hope it never happens in this country, but to prevent it from happening, we have to stand up, take note, vote, and make noise. And not lull ourselves yes. into a false sense of security. And also it won't happen here because we think it's unlikely. Lobby MPs and MPPs to say once the writ is dropped, no more polls released to the public because this is how we got screwed over in Ontario last year. Doug's going to win. That's it. It's a landslide victory. So a lot of people just said, screw it. I'm staying home. We had the lowest turnout in history in the province of Ontario for an election. And he won a majority with 13%. We also had two political parties that decided not to show up for the election, decided that each other was the enemy that needed to be taken down. Yes. Which is really stupid. Anyway, uh, we're not going to make this a debate no, show. No, let's not do that. Let's um, not do that. But this tweet here from PP. Oh, okay. Just a second. I'll put that up right after we read this from Linda. Those rights only exist because people fought for them. If those rights weren't ours at one point in time, they can be taken away again. And that's what I'm getting to. Yep. This is from Pierre Poliev. Canadians support Premier Smith's common sense protections of children. Trudeau must butt out. Okay, Skippy? Yep. Skippy said the same thing on Bill 96, on Bill 21. Uh, no, probably not Bill. Well, no, he didn't. I don't think he said the same thing on the language one. Because that doesn't that doesn't work with them. But on uh, you know people that wear ostentatious religious symbols, mm-hmm. Quebec. He also said Trudeau should butt out on that. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, PP's got it wrong here. Of course, he does. 
Phoebe's got it wrong here. It's not Trudeau that should butt out. When we're talking about people who are looking to violate the charter and take away basic fundamental rights, and in this case, directly insert themselves into the patient-doctor relationship. It's Higgs and Moe mm-hmm. and Smith. Now, Polyev, we need to butt out. They need to get their noses out of the doctor-patient relationship. Well, th- here's a statement from James that is in there. He says, I also support banning surgery for trans kids, but that doesn't make me right wing. And I understand what you're saying, James. But the thing is, children... There is no surgery. There is no surgery for children. There isn't. It doesn't need to be banned. No, it, it doesn't exist. It's already not allowed. Now, there is top surgery. And that's because the doctors and the pediatricians would not have decided that's right. that based on science. And the top surgery that takes place is not a trans thing. And we've also already read, it was eight people uh, under the age of 18 in the province of Alberta uh, that had top surgery. It was not gender related. It had things to do with medical issues. And we don't know what they are because they didn't give us that directly. Uh, uh, Nor are we entitled to know that. But there's no surgery for trans kids, period. It just, it's not a thing. It isn't. So I, I understand where you're coming from, James. I, I get it. Because it's an irreversible surgery if you get bottom surgery if you're male and you transition to female. If you, you, there's no, that's not irreversible. But here's the thing. It's not a thing. <laughs> it isn't. So let's, let's just let that one lie. Yeah. And, I, and I'm going to present I'm, something I'm, to you, though. You'll, Mr. Grizzly, I, I just want to put it, I'm not as sure as you are about that eight number and, and that that's the reason from what I've heard mm-hmm. or what I've heard is there's about, uh, it was about like 23 or 20, 22 or 23. Oh, no, I think eight were under uh, 18 is what I'm getting at. I'm not sure. About oh, okay. That. Well. That's why I'm, I'm thinking that the, uh, I'm not sure about that. I think it might be 22 or 23 uh, because there wasn't like 20, See now you got me. You got me doubting now. Okay. Oh, we'll look um, it up. because I didn't. Uh, I've never seen an eight number anywhere. I've only seen the twenty-two and twenty-three. So I don't know what the ages are. But the reasons that we don't we don't know is specifically because they don't record whether or not the surgery was for gender reassignment or because breasts were too big and it was causing right. pain or because it had something to do with breast cancer. We don't know. There's just no data collected, just like a lot of, there's a lot of our health data that doesn't collect any health data based on race in Canada, which should change because it helps to you know develop programs. So it's just that the data is not collected. So for people, we cannot say that they are mm-hmm. sex reassignment surgeries, and we cannot say that they aren't So we're, we're- because we do not collect we don't the have data, the data at all. So we're going to move on. So anybody who's saying that they are or that they aren't, like this, is in s- filling in blanks with what they wish or need or want to be true for their version of the narrative to fit and not actually based on facts because we actually do not have, have the data. data. Uh, so Cassie says Nate at the breakdown had the stats and she thinks I sound correct. Yeah, so, and that's I think that's why I read it was the breakdown. Oh, okay, it might be on. Yeah, if if you got it from Nate, then, it's factual because yeah, I didn't see that. I saw I saw the Globe and Mail article, and they they weren't breaking down under uh, before or underage. Yeah. Now let's but, let's let's here, here's we'll put an end to this, and we'll move on to another subject. And I have something I'm going to end it with, and I think I think we'll all like this. Watch, this is good. This is really good. Alors, Guignou, uh, vous êtes transgenre, vous étiez une fille, et maintenant vous êtes un garçon. Êtes-vous heureux? Oui, je suis très heureux. Ah, oui. Mais enfin, tout de même, Jésus Oh, ta gueule Voilà, c'était Flash Débat. À demain Alors, Guignou, euh, vous êtes transgenre, vous étiez une fille, et maintenant vous êtes un garçon. Êtes-vous heureux Oui, je suis très heureux. Ah, oui, mais enfin, tout de même, Jésus Oh, ta gueule Voilà, c'était Flash Débat. À demain so basically, for people who don't speak French, it's basically sort of like a debate show called Flash Debate, and there's two peers in there. There's a transgender person, and then there's a person from a religious organization. We believe a religious and the host organization. Asks, we don't know. It doesn't say, but they... they... Yes, yes. Th- this might be a sketch. I don't know if, I don't know if it's real. Uh, but the host asks the transgender person, says, you know, you, you used to be a girl, and now you're presenting a boy. Are you happy? Yes, yes, I'm very happy. 
And then the person from the religious says, yeah, but what Jesus, Jesus and the, the host cuts him off says, shut, shut up. up. This was flash debate. That's the, <laughs> that's, that's the end of the debate. Are you happy? Yes. Are you happy? Yes. Okay. Good. Yeah. Yeah. So, but here's the thing. The thing that we have to understand about this is that specifically with top and bottom surgery, because that's what they're really focusing on, is they're taking something that already is not accessible, that the medical community, after many years of study, has already decided should not be done. So it doesn't happen. It says, and now we're making it illegal. There was no need to do that because nobody was authorizing it. And when you do, the, when you do something, this is the game that's being played. When you take something that is already not happening and that the consensus is already should not happen, and then you say, oh my God, I need to make this illegal. You're engaging in one of the 14 characteristics of fascism, according to Umberto Eco, action for action's sake. Indeed. And by saying it needs to be illegal, that we need some laws around something that is not happening and that everybody has agreed. Yeah, these are not the Umber Umberto Eco ones, but it's, it's, it's right there. Yeah. It's right there. Um, when you're doing that, you are then creating a climate that says, that the teachers and the medical profession must somehow be allowing it if you are banning it, which raises suspicion against these groups. That in their wisdom, based on science and based on evidence, an evidence-based decision have already agreed this should not be happening. Mm -hmm. And it doesn't happen. There's not, there's no doctor in Canada even those who would want to approve a bottom surgery for someone below 18 can actually do it because their medical professional orders will not allow it. Right. It is not happening. It has never happened. There does not need to be a law. So let's move so on. Passing laws for things that do not need laws because it's not already happening. The only thing it can do is villainize the people that are affected by the law. Doctors no longer have the freedom to prescribe medical treatment. It creates that precedent. Even though it was never happening, it creates the precedent. Because if you could pass a law for that, then what else? The point here is that the law was not needed. And you didn't need to stand in front of a camera with soft music and golden lighting and put on your soft voice and say how much you love and you care about someone to say we're now banning something that was never happening. If your intent is to not turn the public against the people who would be requesting that service or authorizing it. It creates the precedent for doing it for other things. Indeed. It's laying the groundwork. So we should not feel so sure. We should not be so convinced that it can never happen here. Because the groundwork is already being laid. Now, whether or not it will go so far or not. It's a good question. But the if the results of this laid. poll, if the results of this poll are true, there are Canadians, at least more than half of them, that believe that they should have a right. They should have a say. They should get a say on what happens between you and your doctor. And there are people that want to get elected they get access to power into the purse strings who are willing to play on that and say, yeah, you know what? You should get a say on whether those people get to access health care. And if it can be true for one, it can be true for all. Mm -hmm. Oh, yes. 
Indeed. We may not get there. There may get there may, may be a point where people go, whoa, 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 that's enough. But the point is, is that our charter applies to everyone, no exceptions. And what we're doing is we're carving out exceptions. And we're legitimizing the process of carving out exceptions. And we should not be doing that. You have the right to occupy any job in the public service, except if you wear a hijab or a kippah or a turban. Or a burqa. Or a burqa. That, except for that, you can't. Yeah. No, no well, religious symbols. Well. But then what next? If you're wearing a pride shirt? Mm-hmm. If you're wearing an I love oil and gas t-shirt, if you're wearing any t-shirt that makes a political statement, right? Then what next? Then what next? Then what next? Slippery slope, right? Slippery slope. So it's just, you can't allow the first step. You just can't allow the first step. Now, one of these reasons why I'm mentioning stuff, because when I joked on Friday that we would be doing a today in gay portion, <laughs> right? So we had that family that moved to Russia because they were afraid we were getting a little too gay. And then we have PP fully, fully, fully committing themselves to the Daniel Smith policy. There's no longer no ambiguity. He spent like a whole week and a half trying to avoid taking a position. Mm -hmm. And now he's all in. Well, while this is happening. Remember, he's also as, dead set against puberty blockers for anybody under the age of 18. Yes, when they'd no longer be useful. He, he's the guy while who closes this is going door on. after the cows have gotten out. See, it's safe now. <laughs> yeah. So while this is going on, I have a little expression that's mm -hmm. called, if you're paying attention and you got your ear to the ground, peace, love, fairness, and equality are slowly and quietly breaking out all around the world. Yes, they are. They are. Plur. And today I would like to bring you to Greece. Greece is the word. Mr. Grizzly. Greece legalizes same-sex marriage. You know, I'm surprised it wasn't legal before in Greece, when you think about it. Yeah, really. <laughs> There's kind of a history. There's kind of a history. <laughs> well, I mean, <laughs> from the country that brought you anal. <laughs> There's a reason we call it in the community doing Greek. <laughs> makes makes well, Greek really? salad a whole new. <laughs> yeah, really. <laughs> That's our that's our don't scare the neighbors term for an orgy. We're having a Greek salad. <laughs> no, that's that's not true. Not kids. true. That's, not true. that's that a up. lie. That's a lie. I just made that up. <laughs> or did I? Need me to, no, no, no. <laughs> that's when the waiter comes over. Need me to toss your salad? Uh, no, I'm good. I'm good. Thanks. Um, <laughs> so now here's the interesting thing about this: Greece has become the first Christian. Orthodox majority country to legalize wow, yeah. same sex because they do marriage. they are they are literally that right yes the majority religion there is Orthodox well it wasn't democracy which is similar to Russia isn't yeah, it yeah funny that eh? one one goes one way one goes the other wasn't democracy a Greek ideal uh, yes it was I was asking that rhetorically, by the way, just, you know, but I thank yes, you for answering. Yes. I, I knew the yes, answer. Yes, it is. <laughs> yes. Same sex couples will now also be legally allowed to adopt children after Thursday's 176 to 76 vote in parliament. Oh. Prime Minister Kyriakos Mits, I love Greek names. Mm -hmm. Kyriakos Mitsotakis says the new law would quote, boldly abolish a serious inequality but it has divided the country with fierce resistance led by the powerful Orthodox Church. Its supporters held a protest rally in Athens. Many displayed banners, held crosses, read prayers, and sang passages from the Bible in the capital, Syntagma Square. The head of the Orthodox Church, Archbishop Irionimos, said the measure would, quote, corrupt the homeland's social cohesion. 
The bill needed a simple majority to pass through the 300-member parliament. Mr. Mitsotakis had championed the bill but required the support of opposition parties to get it over the line with dozens of MPs from his center-right governing party opposed. So he's leading a center-right government. Wow. And he still passed it. Wow. That's pr- well. Yes. Remember. Not all people on the right. <laughs> progressive, conservative. Right? Quote, People who have been invisible will finally be made visible around us, and with them, many children will finally find the rightful place, the Prime Minister told Parliament during a debate ahead of the vote. Quote, the reform makes the lives of several of our fellow citizens better without taking away anything from the lives of the many. The vote has been welcomed by LGBTQ organizations in Greece. Quote, this is a historic moment. Stella Belia, the head of the same-sex parents group Rainbow Families, told Reuters news agency, quote, this is a day of joy. 15 of the European Union's 27 members have already legalized same-sex marriage. It is permitted in 35 countries worldwide. Greece has now lagged behind, Greece has until now lagged behind some of its European neighbors, largely because of opposition from the church. It's the first country in Southeastern Europe to have marriage equality. Wow. Way to go, They don't have it in Romania yet, which is another Orthodox country. Mm -hmm. Way to go, Greece, though, you know? Let's give everybody rights. Yeah. No freedom till we're equal. Slowly but surely. There was a time where there were none. We're now at 35. Canada was fourth. We would have been third, but Spain came out of nowhere. and All of a sudden, just there was no talk of it whatsoever, and then Spain just turned around and said, yep, we're doing it. It's like, oh, great. <laughs> but yeah, we were, we were fourth. They're now 35. Wow. Well. There's a reason you want to live in Canada. Yeah. What was it? We're not afraid to go early. Uh, was it who made the statement the world needs more Canada? Model. Mm-hmm. I believe it, yes, was. it was. So take heart. Take heart. It is happening. But you have to be vigilant. You have to be vigilant. You, you, you can't give an inch. You just can't. I guess, I mean, Polyev has recruited two more potential candidates who are also very, very anti abortion. Also came out in the news very recently. Mm. So he's playing it. He is playing it. Mr. Grizzly, do you have anything? Actually, I do. This was sent to me by Tavi G. I'm going to put this on the screen. This is, uh, wow. I'll leave it at that. And we'll air it and we'll comment afterwards. It has to do with abortion laws, rights, and how things slowly get stripped away because it's kind of been the topic today to a certain degree. Watch this video and then we'll discuss it when we come back. Jesus Christ. Th- th- we tried to warn you. For all of you pro-life Republican women who are voting for Republican men, we tried to warn you. Republican men who want to have children with your wife, but she's not able to, and you use IVF. And Alabama pretty much just got rid of it. Uh, got rid of it. Alabama doesn't have IVF anymore. The Alabama Supreme Court ruled that the I- IVF embryos are protected under wrongful death of a minor act. A, a fucking embryo that's not even fertilized. The, uh, and before you even start, Tennessee. Tennessee that has no exceptions for anything. One of the strictest anti-abortion laws are states in the fucking country. We're talking barbaric laws. The Tennessee Attorney General, who helped write these barbaric abortion laws, had to make a memorandum saying the ban would not apply to unused IVF embryos. So, so you know what's going to happen? This is going to make it up to the fucking Supreme Court. Women, don't you get it? Republicans don't look at you as anything but a vessel. And if you can't have babies, you mean nothing to them. Oh, my God. Um, Like we said, it happens incrementally. You think it won't happen here? It can. It absolutely can. You've got extreme right-wing... Christians, they're crystal fascists, imposing their views upon the vast public. What happened to live and let live? 
they threw that out the window and decided they were going to tell women what they can do. Basically, they want you to be a broodmare for the state. Those are George Carlin's words from about 25 years ago, possibly 30. I don't even remember how long ago that special was. When he talked about it and he said, you know, Frank Zappa said it in the mid 80s. Right wing evangelical Christians, Christians in quotations, because they're not Christian at all, will rob you of your rights. This has been coming for a long time. And I forget who it was at one point in time, might have been in the 60s or 70s, who said they are infiltrating the Republican Party. And if they take it over, we are finished as a nation because they uh, do not have rights in mind. They want to rob you of your rights. They want to control you. They want to be feudal lords and you will be serfs in their serfdom. I can't remember a congressman who said that, and it was a Republican congressman, by the way, who said that because he saw what was coming. There's a few different documentaries available for your viewing pleasure or displeasure or strained viewing, if you will, because they're difficult to watch. There's a few of them online. Jesus Camp is one of them. That one was disturbing. Yeah. There's the one about uh, the National Prayer Breakfast, which yep. they've tried to have on Parliament Hill a few times. And I'm like, yes. get your religion off the hill. Get it off. Religion has no place in the highest office in this land. None. Zero. Jean Chrétien even said so. Jean Chrétien, a Catholic, somebody raised Catholic and went to Mass every Sunday, said, no, not in this office, because I have to govern for all Canadians, and not all Canadians are Christian, let alone Catholic. To govern for everyone, I cannot have religion in this office. And that's how you govern. We are a secular nation. We will remain one, as long as we stay ever vigilant. And I'm, I'm, right, I'm right there with you on that one, Christian. <laughs> All religion is disturbing to me. Yeah, yeah, no, no argument. But, but you have the right to practice your religion. You do not have the right to force your religion upon others. You don't. You never will. Not as long as I draw breath. Yeah. Worship in whatever way you see fit. Do not force others to worship in the way that you deem they should. Worship or don't worship, but don't force people to do it. Because that is taking away a charter right, freedom of choice. And we all know how the freedom convoy goes on about charter rights. They've never actually read the damn charter by the looks of it. They skipped over, I think, they, they read the first two uh, <laughs> lines and then moved on from there. Yeah. Yeah. They did. They did. Um, one last thing before we wrap up here, and it's sort of off topic because we sort of had a thread go through. Mm -hmm. Um, but one of PP's favorite whipping horses is carbon pricing. Yeah. <laughs> and, um, yeah, there's something he, uh, did here. Because uh, CTV News published an article that said uh, Feds rule out carbon price pause despite inflation. Now, um, of course, uh, Skippy did that and didn't put the date of it wherever. He just took the headline. Mm -hmm. and, you know, so we don't know when that is from. Um, but we know that the federal government is definitely, definitely, definitely not going to pause its plan on carbon regulation. And on the 1st of April, every year, the price goes up about $15 a ton. Mm -hmm. So you have Skippy with his ax the tax thing, right? Saying stuff like this, Mr. Grizzly. If you'll put it up and read it. You got to blow that up I'll a bit. I'll blow it up a little bit. Trudeau and the NDP plan to go ahead with a 23% carbon tax hike on April 1st on their path to quadrupling it on heat, gas, and groceries. The carbon tax coalition is not worth the tax. I will ax the tax. Wow, he really is obsessed with the word tax, isn't he? Yes, it appears, what, one, 
two, three, four times. Mm-hmm. In, in what? One, two, three, four lines. <laughs> yeah. Not even complete sentences. Five times if you actually have it included in the link. Yes. Now, here's the thing with that. 23%. That sounds like a lot. Mm-hmm. Doesn't it? Mm-hmm. It does. It does. Part of the show I like to call fun with numbers. Fun with flags. <laughs> oh, have you seen all the Frank magazine parodies? Yes. <laughs> you probably have as young Sheldon. I love it. Uh, They're all brilliant and very funny. Okay. Mr. Grizzly, if you would put this one up. Just a second. Because what does 23% mean in real life? So I went to look it up. What is the federal carbon charge? In 2023, it was $65 mm-hmm. per uh, ton of CO2 <clears throat> emitted. And that amounted to 12.39 cents per cubic milliliter. A cubic milliliter, a cubic, cubic meter. meter. Yes. In 2024, it will go up to $80, up $15 per ton of CO2, which raises the price to 15.25 cents. So Pierre Polyev is trying to get you scared. 2.86 cents. It's not even three cents. Because if he actually told people the carbon price is going up 2.86 cents, ah, would people be as scared as the carbon tax is going up 23%? Now 2.86 cents is 23% of 12.39 cents. Mm -hmm. But in real dollars... In real dollars, it's 2.86 cents. Just like Trump, he's obsessed with size. (laughs) He says 23% because it's way more scary than saying it's going up by 2.86 cents. And if he's telling you that he will ax the tax, basically he's saying that he is going to ax 15.25 cents per cubic meter of gas from your life. So when he's done that and the price of your steak goes down from $29.83 a kilogram to $28.87, let's say, per kilogram, and you still can't afford it, then who does he blame? Yeah, good question. Then what does he do? Then was it? He's got nothing for you. He's literally claiming that fighting against adding another 2.86 cents per cubic meter of gas is going to allow you to feed your family and pay your rent and cover your mortgage. It's not. It's not. And I can tell you that you're, if you live anywhere where there were fires or floods last year and your house insurance went up, if you can get the insurance, if. I'm sure it went up more than 2.86 cents per $10 of policy. Mm-hmm. This is... Uh, it's a joke you have to read the fine print you have to read the fine print he has no plan ax the tax is another one of those three word slogans that sound really cool and I mean nobody likes paying tax so it's very populist but in real dollars not going to make any significant change to your life and it's certainly not going to cover the other things that are going up and it does nothing to address the climate issue which is what is making those those other things go up your food is going up more because of drought or floods or tornadoes 
or cold snaps in the middle of a growing season. Weather-related events. Or war. Ukraine is the breadbasket of the world. Mm -hmm. Than it is from any carbon tax. And if we're not taking measures to mitigate the effect of climate, and remember the next 28 years of climate acceleration are already baked into the cake, that's going to make your bills go up. If we turn around and we say, well, we're not going to do anything to fight it or mitigate it or to try to bend that curb eventually. The money you're going to save on this tax is not going to cover the costs of doing nothing. I do not know how they keep on getting away with making this case. Because it's just math. Mm -hmm. Well, they don't math well, you know that. Media, come on, man. This needs to be framed as he's losing his mind over 2.86 cents. Somebody needs to sit there with a calculator. How many cubic meters of gas does an average family of four consume? How much is that? I don't know. I have no idea. What difference will 2.86 cents make? Somebody do the investigative reporting, do the math, do the in-depth research. Show them to be a fraud. <sighs> you do you do need Mr. to remember Grisner. something though here, and I'm gonna I'm gonna add this in just before we sign yep. off for the day. I um I don't use cannabis. I'm allergic to cannabis. I'm allergic to tobacco. I can't be around it. But I thought years ago that we should have legalized it for the simple fact of the matter is we, you're criminalizing people who are taking something that is uh, medically proven to be less harmful than alcohol, which is a super social product, which you can get damn near anywhere. So, and not only that, it's like you're, you're throwing people in jail. I like that the cost of policing, it was ridiculous. There was no return on the investment. So marijuana was legalized. Cannabis was legalized across the country. Stephen Harper was dead set against that. Now we've talked about how this right-wing evangelical base of Pierre Polyevs wants to rob women of their right to make a medical choice, will slowly strip away contraceptive choices, will outlaw uh, same-sex marriage, and eventually will make uh, gay people identify themselves with a pink armband or something. I know I'm sounding alarmist, but they will take cannabis off the table. So that's just another thing to think about that you will lose. Again, I don't use it. Never have, never will. But think about that for a sec, kids. Yep. It is a thing that will be taken away from you. Yep. Oh, and uh, when you're talking about the, the pink armbands, mm -hmm. uh, it just made me remind, um, in the early days of the HIV pandemic, there was a movement there were people that wanted people who were HIV positive mm -hmm. to be forced to get some type of tattoo. Oh, yeah. I, I remember that. There was actually a few films made about that. So th these are not, these are ideas that pop up every now and then. Mm -hmm. and sometimes they gain traction, but sometimes they don't. But, you know, it's like, I, yep, and the, Wade, I, I get your. I get your point. 2.86 per metric ton when added to the cost of farmers for fuel for harvest, then the fuel for drying grain, then fuel cost to transport, then fuel cost to produce it. It adds up. Yes, it does add up. Mm -hmm. We're not denying that. We're not dying. We're not denying that. But you got to look at the other side of the equation. More droughts, more floods, more crops, more years of no harvest or smaller harvest. Those also add up. At some point, you got to look at both. Sometimes you got to look at both. And maybe there does need to be some consideration for farmers because the liberals have a terrible rural policy. They have no rural policy. Yeah, that's, and that's, that's the policy. It's terrible. It's really, so, yeah. There might, be, there might need to be some considerations. But 
the agricultural sector is one of the top four sectors of GHG emissions. And everybody has to put, you know, everybody has to contribute somehow. So, you know, maybe there needs to be a larger rebate. Because I'm, I'm not sure if the costs for farmers fall under the rebates. And maybe there needs to be rebates for farmers mm-hmm. specifically. Oh, call. To help them cover. The call 8883. We're on 20 platforms. You're on one of them. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So now I know why no one watches your show. Yeah. So uh, everybody watching the show, you're, you're no yeah, one. Apparently. Yeah, apparently. Yeah. yeah. All right. So wait, we don't need to prove ourselves to those. Well, I don't care. Like this. I mean, clearly, right. This, oh, we're now the most biased media platform you've ever heard. We didn't. Oh, this is this is. I'm going to have to ban. You this don't listen to many because do they don't add to the conversation. This is the most biased media platform I've ever heard. You say that it's just facts. You just literally made up a whole slew of things. Tell us what we, we made up. One. Oh no, let's stay here. What let's is, do this. I got time. Yeah. What did we just? What make did up? we make up? Please share with us. Enlighten Be specific. Us, please. Be specific. Let's see, so, okay. Because oh, you've literally cute. said three times you've just literally made up a ton of shit, but you haven't said what what. What what did we make up? You haven't told us. Tell us. Share with us. Oh, enlightened one, please tell us what we've made up. While we put the Jeopardy thinking music on an endless loop, <laughs> um, for this person to come up with something that we said that was not factual. Here's another one here. Uh, the the uh, we didn't talk about the emergencies that we didn't today. talk about. Talk, tell us about some. Tell us about something we talked about today, yeah. Cole. Yeah, please. We, um, we talked about that now, on Friday, and we got a three and a half hour show Friday. about it. If you want to watch Friday's show. Yes, where we went through the actual federal court decision. Anyway, Mr. Grizzly, if you'll put this up, because we were talking about cannabis. We have a W. I never Wilson. said that happened. And you didn't spell my name right. You know what? I, no, nobody said there was no, nobody said anything about making wear badges for getting rid. No, no, that's not factually. No, you're, I, I think, you're, I think you're having trouble with English. My friend. No, no. We also I never said they, they were getting, getting rid, rid of, of cannabis. Them. I said they would get rid of cannabis because Stephen Harper ran his last, pla- last platform on that. Anyway. Okay, enough, um, enough of this. So. Nope. You, nope. you, you got to okay. come with facts. If you can't come with facts, you can just go away. You literally have to say something that we said, sir, or ma'am, or, or whatever. They are, or they, whatever. Caesar, I don't know. I don't care. Caesar, whatever. <clears throat> uh, let's put this one up. W. White Wilson. Anyway, if you put this one up, Mr. Oh, yeah, sure, absolutely. Yeah. And if you, I'll blow it up a bit, if you could put it in. Now, this is apparently a business person. Anyone watching the Canadian cannabis market deteriorate over the last few years? Trudeau legalized cannabis. Trudeau has taxed the hell out of every level, level of our cannabis world. Most participants in the world of cannabis are failing or have failed. Yeah, who? Justin Trudeau. Okay, now we're talking about facts. This is what? F- completely factless, other than the fact that Trudeau legalized cannabis. Um, but they're not, it, the hell has not been taxed out of it. Part of the whole cannabis thing is provincial. Yeah, it's, it's mandated by provincial uh, premiers who decide who gets licenses and how many stores get to open and how many communities. That's why yes. there's 14 with them, of them within a 1.5 kilometer radius of my apartment. Yes. So what has happened here is that it's a merely natural business phenomenon, and Brett Whistlin should know about this. A new market opens up. It gets flooded with contenders and pretenders. There's a messy period when some succeed, some fail, some merge, and others are acquired. We're in that messy period now. Mm-hmm. It came up, there was a lot of money, went up, a lot of players entered, the market's oversaturated, Things will whittle themselves out if you just let the market do what the market will do. Something that conservatives love to talk about. Free market economy, capitalism. Free market economy and let the market speak. Yes. And then once all that happens, we hit a cruising speed. And I compare it to the emergence of techno music. Mm -hmm. Techno music came out. There were a couple of good tunes. Then everybody started to get into it. And there was a lot of of terrible shit that came out that was horrible. (laughs) I remember buying these techno compilation albums that had groups called like Big 23 and stuff like that that were just like, I'm listening to this like, this is crap. And then all of a sudden, 
Then we got EDM. Mm -hmm. And now there's good good stuff. stuff Then the good stuff happened. Market emerges. A lot of people join, thinking that they'll make a quick buck, especially as it's growing. It gets oversaturated. A lot of people close down. And then the players that are serious and that did the job well remain. And then you have an actual market. Mm -hmm. So Brett Wilson, I don't know what he's talking about here, but again, he's doing his thanks Obama thing with regard to Trudeau. Just and totally disregarding that there's a provincial element there. James is right about this though. Yes. Yeah, no, he's absolutely right. Trudeau got his buddies on the ground floor of investment. Wouldn't hang your hat on this issue with Trudeau. He botched this file at every level and then deflected it to the provinces. You are correct. That that's a yep. fact. That's a fact. But it's not because he taxed the hell out no, of it. No. No. The market emerged and he made it such that people that were friendly were able to get in first. It's not right. No. It's it's wrong it's on every right. level. I I completely disagree level. with it. And we're calling out Trudeau for doing that, getting his friends in, giving them sort of insider trading information. Not actually insider trading information because it wasn't on the market at the time. The product wasn't available to be purchased, but you could yeah. you could invest in the companies. I mean, and, and freezing out all the people that were already in the market. Mm-hmm. It was dirty. It way. was dirty. It was dirty. Yeah. We're not, <laughs> it was understand, dirty. we don't think the man is a saint by any stretch of the imagination. We're comparing to the alternative. That's the thing. Not the almighty. And we basically have two parties that have ruled themselves out because Jagmeet Singh can't stop lying about stupid shit. Yeah. Because, and the conservatives just keep on taking a step to the right. No, thanks, Dan. I mean, it's like. It, I'm, it doesn't get to me. I was <laughs> chuckling about it, sir. I, it wasn't troubling me at all. I find it funny. Yeah, yeah. <clears throat> yeah, yeah. It's, it's. Yeah, the, this uh, coal person that came on. And, well, they, they yeah. dropped in some actual facts, though. That was the thing. I, and I think I showed them on the screen. I splashed them up on the screen. They did drop in some actual facts. Uh, talking about how, um, here, I'll, I'll put it on the screen. Everybody could get a license to sell it. That was approved. And now too many stores open. And you're saying that's a decline note, that the supply was too much. They overordered. Put it that way. It, this is true. Yes, but we didn't put a law in saying that you can't, Business is risk. Mm -hmm. Yeah. People entered the market because they think they could, they thought they could make a buck. Too many people entered the market. And here's another comment from, from uh, call 8883. So if I open 12 Starbucks in one small town and only one of them has business, that's not a decline in coffee drinking. That's just bad city planning. No argument. But it's it's not, again, it's not city planning. No. City will approve your permit if you apply for it. And if you meet the regulations, it's not bad city planning. Mm. It's bad business business. planning. It's you that came in and didn't realize that there were 11 other Starbucks in a small town and you decided to open one anyway. Well, and Starbucks. It's not the city's damn fault. Starbucks is not franchised either, by the way. That's a chain. It's it's all corporate owned. But but let's let's assume it was a franchise, right? It's not for the city to come up and say, well, gee, do you know that there are 11 others? Maybe this won't be very wise. The city assumes you've done that work. It's your due diligence. It's like, is your permit in order? Did you pay your fees? Yes. Boom. You get approved. And is it? Like this, take your risk. Do you meet all the requirements to open the business? Okay. You're free to do it. If you didn't do your due diligence to to, to do your market research to make sure that where you were opening your store was in a neighborhood that wasn't already oversaturated by other vendors selling the same product, that's on you. Again, all these people that say they don't want the nanny skate, expecting the state to be their nanny. Please save me from the bad business decision I'm about to make before I make it. That's not their job. That's not their job. Exactly. <laughs> the government's job is not only in very, very specific incidences, like, for example, a public health pandemic. Is it the government's job to save you from making a bad decision for yourself like this? And even in a public pandemic, the government's not actually saving you from making a bad decision about yourself. They're just trying to save you from making a bad decision that can impact millions of others. Because if you decide to not do what you need to do and then go out and cough on a whole bunch of people, because then those whole bunch of people end up going to a hospital 
and the hospital gets so overwhelmed by taking care of those people that it can no longer do surgeries or take care of cancer patients, that's a problem for the government. And it's a problem for all of society. If you go into a neighborhood with already 11 Starbucks and say, I want to open up a 12th one and it doesn't work from you, the only problem for people that get hurt is you. Well, I just... <laughs> Let's just go to the... It's like... You're allowed to make bad decisions for yourself. You absolutely are. Let's go to the count, the uh, the uh, wayback machine, if you will, for those uh, who, who are quite whether or not uh, Harper actually did want to put an end to uh, cannabis sales and distribution before it even began. And look at this little thing here. What's the date on that, sir? October 6, 2015. So just before we went to the polls. Harper says marijuana is infinitely worse than tobacco. Is it? Canadians have one of the high, whoops, one of the highest rates of cannabis use in the world, and a relaxation of marijuana laws is now an election issue. It's a path conservative leader Stephen Harper vehemently opposes, using it to drive a wedge between him and liberal leader Justin Trudeau, who wants to legalize marijuana. After Harper clashed with Trudeau over the issue last week, the prime minister was asked Saturday why he was so opposed. There's just overwhelming growing scientific and medical evidence about the bad long-term effects of marijuana. We spent a couple of generations trying to reduce the usage of tobacco in Canada with a lot of success. <sighs> well, is cannabis infinitely worse than tobacco? Spoiler alert, the Canadian press baloney meter is, is a dispassionate examination of political statements culminating in a ranking of accuracy on a scale of no baloney to full of baloney. Completely metho complete mythology methodology below. Marijuana does carry health risks, and there is growing medical yes. evidence about long-term health effects. But there is a lot of baloney when it comes to marijuana being infinitely worse than tobacco. Let's sort through the haze, the facts. Well, there's about 20 years of research on the health effects of marijuana. The science is still evolving about how the level of usage and the potency of strains and effects uh, strains affect health. A report from the Center for Mental Health and Addiction in Toronto citing multiple research studies said that the daily or near daily use of marijuana can cog can affect cognitive and psychomotor functioning by slowing down how quickly one thinks and acts. This report also ties regular long-term cannabis smoking to respiratory problems with links to bronchitis and cancer. Frequent marijuana use could also exacerbate pre-existing mental health issues, although that link is not well understood. There are also concerns about addiction. About one in every 10 cannabis users risk becoming dependent. The rate for tobacco users is higher at 68%. Each year, about 37,000 Canadians die as a result of smoking tobacco. Tobacco use costs the healthcare system an estimated $4.4 billion. Canadian Cancer Society says that tobacco smoke contains more than 4,000 chemicals, with more than 70% of those chemicals being carcinogens, among the four leading causes of death in Canada, cancer, heart disease, stroke, and lung disease. Smoking tobacco is a main risk factor. The society says that the smoking tobacco is estimated to be responsible for almost one third of all cancer deaths and 85% of all lung cancer case, patients, cases, sorry, the experts. Sir, if you want to take this over, I need to get uh, water for my throat. Okay. Okay. The experts. Research has shown that about 4% of marijuana users report some sort of health, legal, or financial trouble, said David Hammond, the CIHR, that's the Canadian Institutes for Health Research, applied chair in public health at the University of Waterloo. The amount for tobacco is higher, anywhere between 30 and 50 percent, Hammond said, suggesting that tobacco use carries more health concerns than marijuana use. That was the expertise at the time. And it kind of ties in to some of the things that we were saying before about uh, protecting children. Because when we got to the debates during that election, in 2015, Stephen Harper clashed with Trudeau over the issue in the French language debate, challenging him on his position and said, quote, if we sell marijuana in stores like alcohol and tobacco, that will protect our kids? No one believes that. And remember, one of the themes of the, ele the election was Justin Trudeau wants to get your kids hooked on pot, just like they're saying well, right now he wants to give free kids to, kid fentanyl to kids, right? Heavy long-term use of marijuana by teens has been linked to an increased risk of schizophrenia-related mental health disorders in early adulthood, which is why we recommend that don't, people don't start it before the age of 26, said Stephen Laviolette from Western University's Schulich School of Medicine and Dentistry, who researches the effect on the brain of nicotine and THC. 
the psychoactive chemical in marijuana. However, La Violette said those teenagers are using marijuana with a heavy amount of THC. One potent strain has 18% THC. Medical marijuana in Canada tops out at about 5%. And uh, just to put a little thing on that, uh, there was a curling event that happened somewhere. They call it a bong spiel rather than a bond <laughs> spiel that actually has people, you know, it's a now in its fifth year. They actually have people that grow their own and they sample one. The winner of the competition of the grow your own marijuana had a THC level of 30%. Holy shit. We're talking about 18 in this article here. Yeah. So yeah, it is very much different now. Research has also shown these teens may have a genetic predisposition to developing mental health disorders. He said blurring links between smoking marijuana and mental health issues as well. A chemical in marijuana known as CBD has been shown to be an antipsychotic that counteracts THC. Laviolette said creating a debate with more subtleties than political sound bites allow. If you'd like to take over, Mr. The Canadian Cancer Society says research linking marijuana smoking to increased cancer risks is not as strong or comprehensive as the evidence that links tobacco use and cancer. Part of the problem is that marijuana smokers also use tobacco and sometimes mix the two substances. With mental health issues, the science isn't conclusive because marijuana use may exacerbate underlying issues. We certainly know enough to know that there are important risks, Hammond said. We don't know exactly the level of some of those risks and the direction of causality. Is it just people who are already struggling that start using marijuana? But we certainly know enough to know that you should be discouraged from using this. Pregnant mothers should be absolutely discouraged from using this. Nobody is arguing with that. Right. <clears throat> the statement, a lot of baloney, the statement is mostly inaccurate but contains elements of truth. Marijuana does carry some health concerns. Of that, there is little debate. Saying it is infinitely worse than tobacco is a lot of baloney on the CP scale. The data on marijuana use and the links to health appear to be focused on heavy use of high potency strains by teenagers and pregnant women with fewer side effects found in casual adult marijuana users. In terms of the statement that marijuana is infinitely more harmful than tobacco, there's simply no evidence at all to suggest that's true, either in terms of healthcare costs or in terms of relative health dangers, Leviolette said. The cancers and other source of pulmonary diseases associated with smoking, to use the word infinitely, are infinitely more serious than what we would ever encounter with smoking marijuana, and that's well established. Hammond said both substances carry harms and risks to users, but the harms and risks from smoking are significantly greater than marijuana use. I mean, we can go on forever with this. Yes. I just was trying to highlight the fact that there is a faction of the government that lied to you. Former Prime Minister. Oh, yeah. And here's the best part about that lie, because as James pointed out, Trudeau did a lot of things that were incorrect in starting up the industry. He did. I guess. But here's a little thing that you might not be aware of. This is from the Tai on May 19th, 2015. In politics, there's often a gap between what someone says and what they do. Federal Conservative Health Minister Rana Ambrose had strong words in April for Vancouver Council's plan to regulate the more than 80 marijuana dispensaries across the city. Cannabis is an illegal substance with serious health risks, she wrote to Mayor Gregor Robinson. Ambrose wanted that Vancouver's proposed pot rules would end up legitimizing and normalizing the use and sale of marijuana. By that measure, Ambrose should be writing letters to her own ministry. For under Prime Minister Stephen Harper, Health Canada has done far more to legitimize and normalize the use and sale of marijuana than Vancouver. Since 2000, court rulings have made it legal for Canadians to possess and grow small amounts of cannabis for medical purposes. Last year, Health Canada brought in new rules allowing commercial producers to grow medical marijuana in carefully regulated facilities. That was in 2004, when we say last year. That made it possible for firms with names like Tweed, Marijuana Incorporated, and Bedro Bedrocan Cannabis Corp. to go public on the Toronto Stock Exchange. So while they are saying, no, 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 they were creating an industry to get their buddies in Yeah, funny first. how that works. These firms are producing a drug for sick patients, but James West, who tracks the industry closely on the investor news site Midas Letter, says there's more to it. Quote, these guys want to be in a position so that when the recreational marijuana laws change in Canada, they are perfectly positioned. Make no mistake, Health Canada was forced to regulate medical marijuana by court rulings. Yet with a federal election where full-blown pot legalization could become a big issue, it's put the Conservatives in a delicate position. 
Quote, they're going to distance themselves from their own program so they don't anger their base, said Karam Malik, an analyst with the Toronto-based investment bank Jacob Securities. Quote, but they're going to keep it in their back pocket if ever they have to pull out a Trump card. So when we say that Stephen Harper believed in incrementalism, he was justifying it for medical purposes mm-hmm. because the courts forced his hand. Because but then he was going to let the medical industry get its toehold, mm-hmm. which would have all been conservative, favorable organizations at that point. Mm-hmm. And then when there were enough of them, then he might have pulled the plug for overall legalization once all his buddies had already been in and set the foothold. So they both do it. Both parties do it. Oh, yeah. But in this case, it was the party that openly ran on legalizing it that got the right to get their buddies in first. Well, and here I have a, an interview James just sent me. Uh, he did with the Prime Minister be back in 2012, so he was not the Prime Minister at the time. Yep. And uh, let's just, just, it's 2 minutes and 56 seconds. Let's watch this. I think we should watch this. You okay with that, sir? Absolutely. Okay, so let's bring this up. This is our good friend James. He does with, good work. With uh, a candidate at the time. He was, I think he was a liberal leader. Was he the liberal leader then? I don't remember. Anyway. No, I think he became the liberal leader in 2013, I think. Yeah, okay, so pre pre. He was just at the convention. Worried about about uh, you know addressing the third rails of the sacred cows of, of politics. Uh, I think young people are realizing that we need to be bold. We need to make a change. We need to provide alternative. We need to start thinking about uh, longer term solutions. We need to be thinking about broad impacts. That's what you, that's why young people are more engaged than ever before in single issue causes like Greenpeace, Amnesty International, or even local food banks or recycling programs or shelters or whatever. I mean, young people are involved. They just not entirely convinced that politics is a mechanism for changing. The world anymore and that's what the liberal party needs to start doing again listen i mean there's 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 a lot of you know good arguments that says that that say that uh, you know pot is not as as dangerous as tobacco or alcohol and those are legalized uh, however if you look at the big narrative of things we're trying to get away and reduce the consumption of alcohol and reduce the consumption of of, uh, of tobacco and we're trying to encourage people to be healthier uh, and to be more engaged with the world and one of the things that, that pot does is, is disconnects you a little bit from the world it's not great for your health so i don't know that legalizing it although i totally understand the the arguments around uh, removing the criminality from the criminal elements and, and all that uh, i don't know that it's entirely consistent with uh, the kind of society we're trying to build and i'm excited to see that we're discussing it because it's the kind of thing that that is on a lot of people's minds and, and we have to be a party that is willing uh, to talk about things that make some people uncomfortable a little bit or, or you know that are a bit controversial because uh, we're in the business of, of trying to build a better country for everyone Political parties have been very effective through the 20th century by having a very tight core group that you can rally up on the gun register or can rally to protest against the rich. Yep. So there you go. There you go. Even he wasn't convinced. And you can apply that to same-sex marriage. President Obama wasn't all that convinced convinced as well. Same thing with Biden. He changed his tune as well yeah. because they were willing to evolve by learning and listening to people with lived experience. Jeepa, the greater involvement of people most affected. Mm-hmm. It's the Jeepa principle. Well, sir, I, I think we've got, we've got ourselves a show today, do we not? Yes. Thanks, uh, James, for uh, sending us that clip. Yes, thank you. We really appreciate that. And uh, Kits and Cubs, if you do have an opportunity to check out James's uh, Black Ball shows, I don't know if you've got any coming up soon, but uh, please do. He always does really, really good work. We had a great interview last week, too, which I, I started to watch and I got busy. And I, I'm, I'm going to have some time today because although I am working, it's not going to be real busy today. <laughs> yep. The entire private sector's got the day off. So <laughs> there's a lot of thumb twiddling today uh, for my crew. Yep. So, kids and cubs, we hope that you enjoyed this Family Day, Louis Riel Day, Islander Day, Heritage Day edition of the Daily Beaver Morning Show here on the Cryer Media Network. 
because we loved making this for you. And uh, thank you, Cole, specifically for adding to our engagement numbers. Yes, thank you. Because although, Cole, I mean, just between you and us in terms of self-esteem, um, you said nobody watches the show. And, well, clearly you did. And you really you shouldn't call yourself a nobody. You're, yeah, you're worth a little more than that. Give yourself more credit. Yeah. Man. Just saying. Or woman. Yeah. I don't yeah. know. Just, you're not a nobody. Okay. You're just somebody who does not want to have a respectful conversation. No, oh, they added a couple of valid points to the conversation. Yeah, but you did mm, this, yeah. you did that, and you did this, and you did that. That, that. That's not how you say hello. Bring receipts if you accuse of doing something. Please bring the receipts. That's not how you say hello. Had you just come in and said, you know what, guys? Like as you mentioned this, I disagree with this and this, you know? Mm -hmm. Because we have kids that disagree with some of our points or say or ask what if or present mm -hmm. counter like this, and we engage with them. Yes, there's a way to do that. There's a way to do that. But jumping into someone's rushing into someone's house and pointing fingers and making a whole bunch of accusations. Mm -hmm. That's that's not how you're a good guest in someone's home. It's not how it's not being a good guest. Because this is our little home on the web. So you're welcome exactly. in it. But you know, you don't enter our home and then start redecorating. We we put particular we put the furniture where we liked are. it. Like this, you don't really, I have ADHD and OCD. You don't really leave yourself on the carpets and then wipe yourself on the drapes. Not in my house. Right? So there's a way you say hello. There's a minimum behavior. Right? Yeah. So, so it's not that we don't care what you had to say. We had a problem with the way you said it. And if you, you want to come in and, and, and have a conversation with us, we're, we'll welcome anybody. Yep. But don't, don't spout opinions. Give us your facts. Okay. Exactly. As Kid James says, it's more fun to have a robust discussion where you disagree than an echo chamber discussion. I completely agree. Completely agree. Completely agree. Completely agree. Completely agree. That's the whole point. You take the ideas, you clash them, you bring your facts, actual facts, mm -hmm. you bring your arguments, actual arguments that respect the basic rules of fundamental logic, mm -hmm. I guess, and you let the best one win out. And sometimes you agree to disagree. And sometimes you go, you know what? I see how you can see it that way because I just don't. And sometimes you turn around and you say, hey, you know what? I wasn't aware I of that. Yeah, that happens. I, I learned, learned something today. I need to factor that into my thinking. Maybe I need to think about that for a while. Maybe I need to change my, my opinion on something. Because well, you it was like what I learned on Friday. I learned on Friday that you taught me that the Emergencies Act can be applied to specific zones and areas. I, di I thought it was just a Canada-wide thing. Yep. I didn't know that. Yep. So see, that was a TIL on Friday for me. <laughs> Kid James, that's even though you're often wrong. It's civil. <laughs> we're not as we're not we're not as wrong as often as that. <laughs> I see the little wink there. I see the wink. Yeah, we there. got we see the wink. We got you. We got your brother. Exactly. No sandbagging. So uh Cole, if you are listening. Like this and would like to come back at some point yeah. and come correct. You. What you might want to do though is, is join us on our YouTube channel where you can join a lot of people in the live chat because the live show, it starts at 7 a.m. We understand we're not going to get a huge amount of people tuning into the live show. It's throughout the day and at the end of the month when the numbers really count. But it's at the end of the day when people watch throughout the day. And that's the beauty of YouTube. You can watch it whenever you want. Yes. And that, We're live. And if you join the live show, you can join in the robust chat. And those are only the YouTube numbers. There's that's the right. 20 other platforms and all the other ways that were carried through podcasts and all the podcast networks and all that kind of stuff. So when you add it all up, like I said, we don't need to go and preen around when you say nobody watches the show and we don't have to come out and say, hey, we got X number of thousand. We don't need to do that. Because we know what our numbers are. And we don't yeah, need we to justify and prove it. We know how this works. Because it's our industry. We know how it works. If you don't, it's that's okay. okay. You just learned something. You're allowed to not know. But you're making an assumption based on incomplete and incorrect information. And your, informa and your opinion is ill-informed. 
There you go. That's such a polite way to say that. Well, it's like the Globe and Mail used to have that tagline. Everybody is entitled to an opinion, but is it informed? Mm -hmm. Being informed is a choice. Make good choices. (sighs) All right. If you would like to support us, you can. Because the Ray Girl, the wonderful Ray Girl, has made it you so such that you can happen by sponsoring our pod page. I am sorry, I have to sneeze. Go ahead and sneeze. Make sure you hit the mute button before you do, though, because otherwise it can be really loud. I can actually mute you from here if you need to. I'll mute him that way so we don't hear him sneezing. I sneezed seven times in a row the other day, which is not a record, but it's awfully close. I think my record is eight. Um, and then, of course, you get very lightheaded after sneezing, as you can see by the look on your face, sir. <laughs> <sighs> Whoa, that was a good one. Uh, uh, that was better than pot. Uh, the petit mall. <laughs> yeah, don't sneeze on the microphone. <laughs> Absolutely. No. Absolutely. Um, yes, so because of the Ray Girl, you do not have to because she sponsored our pod page. That's podpage.com slash the true north eager beaver lowercase letters with a hyphen between each one of those words. And if you scan the QR code underneath my chin, that will bring you right there. When we have an episode fresh off the bandwidth, it comes directly to you. So there you go. If you'd like to support us in other ways, make like Kit Elaine and go to our True North Eager Beaver YouTube channel. We really appreciate it when you do that. There we have three buttons for you to uh, play with. Let's play with our buttons. We like that. Like, share, and subscribe. Our three favorite words other than... Free beer today. Which you could also help us with. By scanning the QR code by Mr. Grizzly's head, that brings you to our coffee page. That's coffee. Ah, Miss Shadika, I smashed the like button first today. Yes, you get a medal. And by the way, happy belated birthday. I hope it was a good one. It was yesterday. And happy birthday to Kit Connie as well, whose birthday was also yesterday. So, yay. Happy birthday. Yes. So, uh, yes, if you go to our coffee page, that's coffee-com. K-O, sorry, coffee-com. (laughs) <laughs> coffee.com ko hyphen fi.com i'm very cute today <laughs> not particularly bright but very cute <laughs> uh, <laughs> slash eager beaver <laughs> what you got lowercase letters all in one word and there you can make a contribution to the emergency hydration fund here at the beaver lodge which makes sure that we do get some free beer today yay <laughs> and it's a holiday so i can day drink um so <laughs> not for me i'm working oh it's nona's birthday today too yay hey, hey, happy Nona. birthday Nona. and uh happy early birthday for mohan on the 29th wow a leap year baby oh, how wow, cool, cool is that wow happy quadrennial <laughs> um what else do we have for you oh yes because democracy is something that you do um, write those letters to your MPs, your MLAs, your senators, your media, all that good stuff. Again, go support uh, HamiltonHelps.com uh, to uh, uh, sign the position to encourage uh, our officials to open up the armories to help people stay warm during the winter. Tell them that you want a also a uh, school food program so that kids can learn on full bellies, all the good stuff. If something is uh, majorly important to you, write about it. Handwrite. Do it in your handwriting. Let them know it's really important. Uh, let's see, what else do we have for you today? Oh, yes, we love to hear from you. So our email address is truenorthagerbeaver at <laughs> gmail.com. Oh, my word. Okay, my sneeze count has been increasing over the years. I have autosomal dominant compelling helio helioophthalmic outburst at you syndrome <laughs> that's good uh, I, love uh, I love i like that, that. that's really well done. Uh, i like love that. that that is brilliant ah uh, love that love it love it love it um, I, I was curious uh which background do folks pref- like the, the bookshelf or the night sky or i even have another one here i was like debuting let me see if i can find it. i'm just curious what people think uh, I was going to use this one from when I was in Canmore a little while back, but you can't see the mountains very much in that one. So is Mike from Canmore? Mike from Canmore. <laughs> I'm Mike from Canmore. I'm just curious. Uh, all right, what else do we have? Uh, I don't remember where I was. Uh, da, 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 da. We did go. the democracy something that you? Oh yeah, email if you'd like to write us. 
truenortheakerbeaver at gmail.com. If you're listening to us on Apple, please uh, give us some stars and uh, some reviews. We really appreciate that. And uh, we did the democracy something that you can do. So um, from the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying, oh, yes, 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 yes. You're right, Kit Cassie Wobb did launch the school nutrition program in Manitoba. That's good stuff. It's really good stuff. Absolutely good stuff. I like Wob. I really like Wob. Yeah. Oh, we got one vote for the, the bookshelf here, there, Mr. Grizzly. Bookshelf? Okay. Okay. Oh, well, that's one vote. Okay. That's one vote. All right. Um, from the Beaver Lodge, this is your eager beaver saying it could be a tough world out there, kids. So please be kind to and gentle with yourselves. Mr. Grizzly, some words of wisdom, please. Yeah. I think this was kind of what I went with on Friday, but I'm going to go with it again today. Stay ever vigilant, folks. Remember, democracy is something that you do, and it is perilously in danger right now. It really, truly is. Apathy is the enemy, and we can't let people get apathetic towards democracy or towards our democracy. You need to ignore the polls. Vote for who you think is the best candidate in your riding. Now, the federal election is a year and a half away, so no need to panic. But just pay attention. Pay attention to what the uh, opposing parties are saying. Pay attention to what one specific party wants to do if they ever gain power. Because in the words of former Prime Minister Stephen Harper, you won't recognize Canada when I'm done with it. Something tells me Pierre Polyev is not patient like Harper was. Something tells me he would not believe in incremental changes. Something tells me he would like to make the slate wiped clean and start over from scratch after he puts more money in your pocket by canceling taxes like the CPP and EI, which are not taxes. Stay vigilant. Kid James's mom. Who's that speaking? His voice is amazing. Apparently someone has a crush on you. Hey, James, Mom, how you doing? If, if you really like what you hear, you can join me this evening when I'll be doing an ASMR via this studio microphone, and I speak just like this. <sighs> Throw your panties across the screen. <laughs> maybe not james mom though <laughs> respect respect that's that's too far but if you do, far, but if, you do <laughs> if you if that if, if the if that's your thing there's nothing wrong with that <laughs> yes cassie says it well democracy works if you stand up look at manitoba a politician with integrity can win <laughs> just goes closing the window now <laughs> okay that's enough <laughs> i love it um kids uh before we come back with the easter egg uh, i also want to thank you for being a little patient with me as you could hear i am a little stuffed up i got mm-hmm. a little bit of a cold here so i've been uh, coughing and my voice hasn't been there today and sneezing it's stuff, stuff, so, uh, a little bit stuffed up yeah, i'm a stub dub so uh, <laughs> thank you uh, for uh, your indulgence today mr grizzly roll the credits and we'll have some news about some kids. you are listening to a true north eager beaver media incorporated podcast The True North Eager Beaver podcasts are proudly brought to you by our founding sponsors, The Misfy Mysteries from Corvid Moon Publishing, your source for science fiction, fantasy, and cozy mysteries featuring a broad diversity of characters, CanadianTarot.com, your uniquely Canadian online eclectic tarot community, and The Peppermaster, hot pepper sauces made from farm fresh ingredients to thrill your taste buds and expand your mind. We are grateful to the Cryer Media Network for its support, Pete Jarvis for our artwork, and Paul Joseph Something for our opening and closing sequence music. Okay, this is going to be a long Easter egg now because <laughs> it's going to be longer than I intended. Oh, really? First of all, Cassie, James's mom has got it going. <laughs> That's just brilliant. Number two, Kitlin M. Yes, you did just hear a rooster. That's because we have some lovely new uh, theme music to go along. 
thanks to Canada's favorite snowman, Cranky Canuck, who says he loves the theme. <laughs> I, I wonder why. Yeah. <laughs> I had so a chance could, on the weekend to incorporate that into our ending. So. Yes, and we'll probably have to re-record a new ending to uh, give him uh, some credit there as well. Yes. But uh, yes, kids and cubs, let us know if you like uh, the theme. It's uh, for those who recognize uh, classical music. I think it's Edward Grieg, I believe his mm. first name was. His theme, Morning, uh, but has a little bit of a ragtimey uh, version to it because, you know, we both kind of like jazz. So, <laughs> thank goodness, I thought I was having a stroke. <laughs> no, 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 no. We, we, we brought, we brought a <laughs> oh God, I've got to, uh, see, I want to, the, res, the respectful good me wants to say was, we brought a rooster into the show, and then the naughty me goes, yeah, we brought some cock. I was going to say, end your day with the sound of a big cock crowing. <laughs> crowing. <laughs> it's in the Bible, don't get offended. It's in the Bible. <laughs> well, I'm, I'm going to daily beaver for your daily dose of cock. I'm going to I'm going to incorporate the rooster at the beginning, but it's like it's trying to get it all blended together. It's time consuming, and I only have so many hours in the day. Oh man, I tell you, we are not right in the head. Oh, jeez, <laughs> but yes, you are not. You are not hearing things. You no, are you're not good. Hearing things. Um, we have more. Uh, world champions, uh, Mr. Grizzly, uh, to talk about uh, the world single distance speed skating championships have closed, and uh, there's a lot more medals uh, for Team Canada. Uh, in the mass start, uh, there was a silver medal for Ivani Blondet and Antoine Julien Beaulieu. Cool. At uh, the world. Uh, um, we'll uh, take that down. Although that's a really great picture, isn't it? Yeah, it is. No, it's a great photo. Yeah. Uh, that's a photo of um, Ted Jan Blumen, Olympic medalist, mm -hmm. who won the silver in the 10,000 meter race, which was like the big marathon that we have. Uh, and the other person, unfortunately, his name I cannot remember off the top of my head. Ah. Uh, who finished third in the race for Canada. So Canada took second and third in the 10,000 meter race uh, at the World Single Distance uh, Championships. Um, what else did we have? Uh, Laurent Dubreuil uh, won a medal in the 500 meters. And I believe uh, it was the gold, if I am not mistaken. Ah, uh, uh, darn. Nah, don't worry about it. We'll get to it tomorrow. Ah, uh, darn, 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 darn. Hurry up. <laughs> okay, sir. I'll do it tomorrow. Sorry. Everything um, went bad. It happens. You got to pee? Well, yeah, desperately. Go, go ahead. Really? Oh, yeah. I got enough. You have more I, to I say? I, I, I have enough stuff. Okay. All right. I'll be back in a minute. <laughs> all right uh i'll try and find that information uh for you uh, kits and cubs i'm uh, so sorry uh i had it here and for some reason i must have uh, closed the window by accident um but yes uh the men's and world's uh, men's and women's team pursuit squads reached the podium helping Canada canada earn medals in all four of the team events because they won the golds in the sprint uh, both of them, but uh, Valérie Balté, Ivani Blondin, and Isabelle Weidemann, uh, who are the reigning Olympic and world champions, captured the civil, silver medal in the sprint. And uh, it was the fourth world career world championship medal for them. Uh, Hayden Meyer from Toronto, Connor Howe from Canmore, and Antoine Jeline Beaulieu followed up with a bronze medal performance in their own sprint race, which is also very good. I think we came out of there with something like 10 medals or something ridiculous like that. We're the um, second best nation in long track speed skating uh, behind the Netherlands. And uh, of all the sports at the Winter Olympics, um, we uh, speed skating is the one in which we've picked up the most medals, uh, Canada. So it's, it's one of the best ones uh, for us out there. Um, 
when we go to the the, the World uh, Aquatics Championships also closed off over the course of the weekend, and Canada emerged from that with 11 medals in all. And uh, on the last day of uh, the competition, we scored another bronze in the women's 4x100 medley relay. So uh, that was uh, very good for Team Canada there. So, uh, yeah, we emerged with 11 medals at, in all. I think it was two gold, three silver, and six bronze, which is very good. In tennis, um, Louise Kwong, who we talked about a lot last year uh, in doubles, uh, is still with her partner. Um, her last name is Ulya Shenko. I can't remember off the top of my head what her first name is. Uh, but they won a competition out uh, over the course of the weekend, which is very good good uh carson branstein also made the final in the women's singles in Antalya, turkey uh, but she had to retire uh, during the match uh, due to an injury of some kind so um yeah we had that going on and uh also at the um, canadian women's curling championships the scots tournament of hearts um yesterday was sandra schmerler day uh, Sandra Schmerler is uh, the person uh, that skipped Canada to the first gold medal uh, in curling at the Olympics. And um, she, she was a great champion, but she also believed in uh, many causes. And when we say about uh, democracy is something that you do, uh, she really did believe in it. And every year now at the Scotties on the first Sunday, uh, there's sort of a telethon because there's three matches and all the curlers go up there and they answer phones and people make donations and they raise money for the Sandra Schmirler Foundation, which raises money for critically ill newborns to buy hospital equipment to right. provide a better neonatal care. And yesterday they set a goal and Sandra did pass away from cancer. Yes, that's true. It's quite they, a few years ago now, isn't it? A million dollars. Oh, wow. And they met it. Excellent. So that's everyday Canadians just sitting at home watching curling cheering on all their Canadian favorites, just phoning in and opening up their wallets and making $1 million available for some awesome. vulnerable kids who come into the world premature or with illnesses, serious illnesses, just, and who need some help. And they're making sure that the equipment is there for them. So uh, way to go, Canada. Way to go, Canada. Way to show up. And here we go. Now I've got the, the world uh, speed skating stuff for you. We emerged with two gold, six silver, and two bronze for a total of 10 medals. Uh, the Netherlands was first with 13. The closest nation other than that was the United States with five. So we really are dominating there. In the 500 meters, Laurent Dubreuil won the silver, the men. In the 10,000 meters, Ted Jan Blomen, who we mentioned, won the silver. And it was Graham Fish, who's the other guy in the photo, who won the bronze. Uh, we won the bronze in the team pursuit. That's Antoine Gilles de Beaulieu, Connor Howe, and Hayden Maillard. And we won the silver in the mass start. That was Antoine Gilles de Beaulieu as well. We got the silver in that. For the women, uh, Isabel Vitamin won the silver in the 3,000 meter race. Canada won gold in the team sprint with Carolina Hillier, or Hiller, sorry, Madison Piman, and Ivani Blondet. And then in the team pursuit, Canada won the silver with Ivani Blondin, Valerie Malte, and Isabelle Weidemann. And then in the mass start, Ivani Blondin won the silver. So Ivani Blondin has three medals from the World Championship. And she is one of the top 10 individual medal earners in history at World Championships in speed skating. Wow. Yeah. Kick ass. That was a very, very long Easter egg. I'm sorry for being a little disorganized there, but I thank you for your patience. Have a wonderful day. I'll see you.